And we do have a sponsor. Good morning, Representative Bolden. For the record, my name is Amanda Bolden. I represent Hillsborough District 25. Um, I sent an email late last night. I asked that you either kill this bill or sit on it until the deadline just to see what the Senate does with HB 173. And he's not here, but I had a joke lined up that I won't be taking any questions unless they're from Representative Jared Sullivan. And the question is, I told you so. <laughs> but just to be clear, HB 173, you guys already covered this with an extensive amendment. And so this isn't necessary unless the Senate rejects what this committee unanimously passed that passed the House on right. the third of this month. Okay. So, so well, yeah, probably would just interim study it so that we'll see what happens. I think you have until March 21st to vote on out. this right. if you so want to hold on to the it. the Senate will take action before then. And this isn't the same as HB 173, but it's the same enough that you can do to it what you did to HB 173. Okay. If you want a second bite at the apple. Oh, I see. Right. Just, we could do that too. We've been known to do that. <laughs> okay. Any questions from the committee members? Seeing none, we thank you very much for your testimony. Thanks. Enjoy your break. Right. Not quite. <laughs> uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, Philip Sherman. And now you oppose the bill? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Chair, members of the committee, I, I support the representatives uh, of you of sidelining this. We worked with you on 173, so uh, mostly here just in case or, or if there are any questions. So your 173 was the right answer. We don't need to. Yes, sir. <laughs> you got it right. <laughs> Shorter the bill, the longer the sessions, right? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Does uh, anybody else wants to testify on 1159? I don't know, Mike. You see what you're, work you're working on? You're all set. Okay, great. All right, then we will close the public hearing at 1159. Yeah.
Chair, and good morning, everybody. Thank you um, for hearing my testimony. I am Jerry Stringham, uh, for the record. I'm the state rep uh, representing uh, Lincoln, Woodstock, and Easton, the heart of the White Mountains, including Loon Mountain, Woodstock Inn, and at this time of year, the Ice Castles make a nice place to go. I'm serving uh, my second term here. Um, I've invested considerable time uh, in issues impacting the disabled, having been uh, sponsor of, of four different bills on the disabled. And, um, but my background is, is as a business person. Uh, as a graduate of Harvard Business School, uh, and I run my own consulting firm for the past 25 years, which has supported over 200 uh, startups in the medical device field. Um, so I understand businesses have many rules protecting workers, customers, neighbors, and society in general that are important, but they can be onerous to implement. Uh, none, nonetheless, business owners, I found, are very willing to accommodate reasonable regulations, but ask that they be appropriate. Uh, which brings me to HB 1117. Um, uh, you know, we have, you know, wonderful program uh, here in the state and nationwide uh, to support those that are disabled by allowing them to bring service animals uh, into our businesses. Um, uh, but uh, some of the restrictions on them have made it uh, difficult for the owners of the businesses to differentiate those that are truly eligible from those that are, sh that are not. Uh, which makes it both difficult for the businesses and for those who truly need uh, the access uh, to things like a hotel or a restaurant with a service animal. So I, I view this, uh, this bill as a program integrity bill. So um, with that as a background, I'll discuss the role of service dogs, uh, the mandates uh, for businesses created with the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the chaos created at certain businesses by misrepresentations by certain dog owners and requests by local businesses from relief from those claiming their pet as a service dog when they're not. Uh, and um, uh, they'll also discuss the original bill and uh, an amendment option. Um, service dogs play a critical role for many handicapped uh, individuals with disabilities and to help them live a normal life. This includes those suffering from blindness, hearing loss, and other physical and mental disabilities. A trained service dog allows a disabled person to live a life in a substantially improved way, compensating for these physical and mental limitations. Um, mandates uh, to support the access for service animals came nationally with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, this was passed in July of 1990 and is a comprehensive civil rights law for people with disabilities. The ADA promises open access to public facilities for those with these disabilities. Among access provided through the ADA is access to hotels, stores, and restaurants. Federal law dictates uh, largely what is required. Uh, a two-page flyer is available on page one and two of the package that I have submitted. This is available uh, from the state of New Hampshire. Uh, current fe federal law limits states uh, from requiring professional training of service dogs, uh, requiring any license uh, of a service dog specifically, although other than uh, licenses that any other dog would have to obtain, and allowing volunteer licensing use of any particular gear. So um, it, to be a, cert a, a, a service dog in New Hampshire, you don't have to have the vest on, you don't have to have a little tag, uh, and, um, uh, and then the requirements are, are stated here. So I did notice, you know, I looked at this thing probably 20 times before I came in here today. And on the first page, uh, on the right side, service animals welcome. And, uh, you know, there's a statement there about it's, in, it's illegal to misrepresent your dog. But it actually says it's illegal to represent a pet as a service animal. So... Uh, I think they wanted to say misrepresent, and it's a typo, and I, I just just caught that right before being here today. So, um, but anyway, chaos created at businesses. Uh, the net effect of current service dog reg registration is that dog owners can largely self-certify that their dog is a service dog and develop their own criteria. Um, 
at, at least at, at least as far as uh, approaching a business. I received complaints from several business owners about uh, the abuse of required service dog accommodation, uh, accommodations. Uh, I'll talk about Igor Beely. He owns the Montag cabins in North Woodstock. The renters of the cabins arrived with their dog and indicated their dog was a service dog. Later, he watched a tape at the front desk where they looked up at the, at the New Hampshire flyer provided and realized there was nothing that Montauk cabins could do and would have to accept their representation. Uh, he is out of the country today, or he would have been here to explain how mislabeled dogs have, have been left unattended in rooms and bark all day, upsetting other customers. Uh, another example is a restaurant owner described how individuals brought a dog into a restaurant, sometimes with a service dog vest that you can buy on Amazon, and proceeded to either eat food off the plate of another patron or go to the bathroom on the floor. So, um, and finally, a dog trainer in Conway described the, uh, the corruption and chaos brought to the pet, uh, PetSmart where she works as owners mislabel their pets as service animal and they proceed to get in fights with other dogs, clearly not trained. The way that the service dog provisions uh, envisioned uh, when put into law in the 1990s. So the request by local businesses, um, you know, all these people admire and appreciate the value of having access to service pets to their establishments. However, there are dogs gaining access and creating havoc in their businesses. Um, in the case of the restaurant owner, she's no longer in the restaurant business. And she cited this as one of the frustrating realities of running businesses. Um, so, um, some, some of the more obvious possible remedies were included in an early draft of what is now HB 1117. Uh, this bill is introdu introduced, covers a committee to develop uh, active legislation. It is not legal to require a service dog be registered unless all dogs are registered. All dogs are required to be registered in New Hampshire once they're four months old. So registration is done through the local town halls. At present, most dogs register via an online form. Uh, I put together another possible amendment to this bill, uh, uh, 0308, um, as a way to expand the current registration to at least uh, um, uh, provide for people to optionally and on a self-directed basis indicate that their dog, their, their dog is a service dog. Uh, in I'll go ahead and pass this around. Uh, the, in, in this bill, the, the town halls would include a reg, would uh, after a registration include a list of those those dogs that are listed as being service dogs, and the Department of Agriculture would create a publicly accessible list. Uh, while dog owners could maintain that their pet is a service dog, even as if registered as a regular pet when they arrive at a restaurant. Uh, it could help f facilitate uh, better interaction and discussion when individuals show up uh, to make use of the services of our very valuable businesses. Um, in a conversation with Commissioner Jasper, he also felt the Commerce Committee could authorize the two separate license tags um, be created, one for service dogs and one for non-service dogs. At present, at registration, we only have uh, one style of tag. Tag, again, it cannot be required by federal Americans with Disability Act uh, that service dogs have this license. But I see it as being friendly to the intent of the ADA, uh, respectful for those who really need access to the services provided by the service dog provisions, and respectful to businesses that, when a New Hampshire licenses a dog, they indicate whether or not their dog is 
a service dog. Finally, with current laws, uh, uh, allow service dogs to avoid paying a license fee, uh, you have to go to, to uh, uh, the state house to, to get that. It's strictly optional, it's almost never used. Um, I, I don't think it's necessary uh, that that be included in the amendment, but that's what came out of um, OLS when they drafted this. Uh, finally, um, uh, there, there may be uh, interest in, in uh, having individuals uh, uh, classify their animals as uh, comfort animals, um, which is not service dogs. Um, and, um, but some people, I, I think, naturally uh, miss misconstrue uh, that their very special dog uh, is not just a regular dog, even if it's not a service dog. And I think having the option of putting something in the middle may, uh, uh, e even though it carries no legal weight above a regular dog, may keep them from check marking a box saying they have a service dog. So um, I have I have uh, also included uh, relevant sections of the Americans with Disability Act printout on service dogs for your information, um, and as well as you know, you have a copy of the bill and the potential um, amendment. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, Representative Spear. Thank you. Just as a question. What are other states doing? I mean, we can't be the only state that's in this. Do you know? Um, other states have different definitions of what service dogs are, but it seems like every, you know, I went, I went through, um, um, you know, OLS and their research support, and there wasn't a good bill that I could, I could piggyback on. Sorry, Representative Gibbs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I should uh, back up my question by saying that my whole career was in equal opportunity law, first mm -hmm. in uh, with the state of New Hampshire mm -hmm. and then with the federal government. So I, I know something about this. Um, and my question is, um, uh, since you're considering um, this optional a uh, special kind of registration as perhaps a deterrent to people incorrectly um, misrepresenting their dogs, um, uh, which I agree has, has been a problem both for people, uh, both for businesses and for people who have actual service dogs mm -hmm. um, and, and um, you know, want to be sure that that's recognized, but might not the existence of that special registration um, result in business managers um, uh, incorrectly um, uh, taking the position that a dog without that special tag uh, or other special identification, uh, in fact, is not a service dog and therefore does not have to be allowed where a service dog could go. Well, I, the the owners I've talked to have you know seen seen materials like put out by the state. So, um, uh, you know, if, if the law is that they don't have to have that, it's just some certification that gives them more confidence that these people actually do have a service dog. So, I um, uh, the business owners I've talked to didn't didn't seem to think that was, uh, I mean, they, they, under, they understand the restrictions of the federal law that a, a certification is not required. Other questions? So um, this, uh, ironically, uh, this past week, I was uh, confronted with a situation where I just looked, checked out my email and they did use the term service dog. And um, in this case, I, I do have a vacation rental, mm -hmm. and um, and the uh, people which it, uh, and I had two different customers, <laughs> wow. and uh, and one of them said, "Well, fine, we'll just do business somewhere else." Okay, because we said no, no dogs, right? And then the other one said, "Well, gee, I thought we everybody had to take service dogs," 
And so, so I was thinking, okay, so now we need to explain to this person the difference between a service dog and a comfort dog. But my wife said, no, no, we're going to remind them that vacation rentals are homes <laughs> and anybody's allowed to borrow a dog from their home, even a service dog, right? Uh, and uh, a real service dog can be barred from somebody's home. And that, that was the tax he took. And the person then came back and said, well, we do have an RV and we could keep the dog in the RV. Hmm. Well, obviously that is no longer a service dog. If the dog is in, <laughs> it's going to be left inside an RV. <laughs> so that subject was ended. So I guess really uh, to tell you that, yes, I, I understand the stress, but I, I, you know, I mean, I myself personally, um, you know, my, my original mother-in-law, she, she was deaf and she had a service dog. So I knew right uh, way back, I mean, I'm talking 30 years ago about service dogs and dad, a service dog has a special jacket. It literally says, do not touch me. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, so that there's plenty of giveaways. If you see a dog that whether it's a service dog or a comfort dog, comfort dogs usually don't have that jacket on. They have some fur coat on or something, <laughs> something related to the weather. So, so I guess my, my problem is, is that, uh, is to understand. So this legislation you want to have is for hotelers to who are uninformed, who don't know the law, and that you want to have us pass some kind of legislation to better inform them or give them a better way. Because all they have to do is say, well, if it's a service dog, you know, obviously they can't ask the person what their handicap is. But they certainly can say is where's the dog certification and why doesn't it have the have that special jacket on there that says do not touch me. So yeah. I guess I'm I'm trying to you know, that's it. Yeah, you are hoping legislation is going to come out of this study committee. That's what I was hoping. The you know the they they uh, service dog does not have to wear a service vest. It does not have to be professionally certified. You can if you have a sore back. I'm just giving an example. You have a sore back, and you teach your dog to pick up your napkin if you drop it. You can then make the certification that that dog is now handling an essential function for you, and that's a service dog. And um, and you, you you know the 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 the, the federal laws of you know don't give us a lot of leeway to um, put a lot of restrictions on on um, what is required for a service dog to be a service dog, uh, such that um, restaurants and, um, uh, you know, hotels are, are required to provide access for them until they misbehave. So. Okay. But, but, Representative sorry. Gibbs has a question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, what I actually have is a comment uh, and a suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, having worked in this field for many years, um, and that is that anyone who is thinking of um, excluding a dog that has been identified as a service dog, whether it has a special tag or jacket or whatever, um, from a a home, uh, rental home, hotel room, uh, anything of that nature, check with the um, HUD Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity uh, before you exclude that dog and get a complaint. Um, and similarly for a uh, restaurant manager, check with the um, US uh, Department of Justice Office of Civil Rights. Uh, you can also check with the uh, New Hampshire Commission for Human Rights, which also works in this area. It really uh, will do you a lot of good to have the straight up information uh, before you get a complaint. So just trying to be helpful there. Yeah. Thank you. Would you believe? <laughs> OK, Re Representative Grassi. Would you believe that I'm on Amazon right now and I can buy a nice vest <laughs> and a card and a thing, a tag that says access granted by federal law for less than $19, and I could put it on my cat and call them a service dog, I suppose. Service cat. Right? Um, and what if I service does a cat it's, do? It's in Amazon. Unfortunately, I've got it blown up to a size. Check the I can't mice get in the restaurant, in the hotel. Back down to size. There we go. I mean, it's, 
there are all kinds of things you can buy. And having worked in the in the transportation industry, this is a big problem that we have. I mean, I had somebody come up with a little, and we I, I work in a bus bus business. Yeah, go right ahead. And the thing is, is that I've had people come up with chihuahuas and say this is a service dog. And, you know, you can't argue with them in most cases because if you do, they sit there and they threaten you. And it would be nice that if we had places that had a sign posting, particularly with how much of a fine you could get if you misrepresent. I had somebody say that their boa constrictor was a, was a comfort animal. And, of course, comfort animals are not covered under ADA. But the thing is, is that people think they are. Right. That was a would you believe. Would you believe. Okay. Yeah. So. But here's the problem. Would you believe the federal government says we can't require anything to prove it? Yeah. So we're, we're we're in a pickle here. Okay. Next question, Representative Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for presenting this bill to us. I'm just doing some uh, research on my laptop here. I googled it. Uh, so I'm looking at the U.S. Service Animals dot uh, org. It's the official service and support animal registration. And there's a couple paragraphs here. Uh, it says it's illegal to ask the handler to demonstrate the abilities or training of the dog. Yeah, yeah. And I'll get to a question, but I just want to set it up here. So I'm looking at usserviceanimals.com. It's the official registry of uh, service and support animals. And it says it, it's illegal to ask the handler to demonstrate the abilities or training of the dog, even if you don't see the dog perform its task. The handler also does not have to produce any proof or the dogs of the dog's training, and you are not allowed to ask about it. And then another paragraph says, there is no registration requirement or certification pro pro process for service dogs. The ADA states that any required registration or certification would be considered a form of discrimination. Service dogs don't have to have any form of identification labeling them as a service animal. So I guess my question is if the ADA says it's discrimination to ask, how can we enforce it? Uh, that, yeah. That's my point. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think this is the kind of problem that the, the business owners have. Uh, they're told um, only two questions may be asked. Is the dog required because of a disability? And what task or work has the dog been trained to perform? Oh, so you are allowed to ask those you questions. You are allowed to ask those questions. But you can't ask to prove, I, I prove the trick. You can't ask them to prove it. And, um, uh, and you know, if they can't answer it, I don't know what that means. So I, you are somewhat allowed to ask the persons what their handicap is because you're asking what, what your, what the and task that, is. That makes some sense because if the handicap is something that you would have to make additional compensations for as the Ooh. business owner, uh, right. it, it might be. We don't want anybody with a bad back. You'll complain about our beds. <laughs> yeah, you need extra extra firm cushions, right? <laughs> and mattresses. So, um, and you can't require you can require dogs to be licensed, but it's optional whether they want to. Uh, you can make it an option for them to to make it a to register as a service dog. So that's that's kind of why I came into the we. Right. We, we do require dogs to be licensed in the state of New Hampshire every every year. and um, right. But that doesn't mean it's the, still, the, game, it, the dog comes from, you know, the, you the still, renters, my renters, a lot are mostly out of state. That's so, true. And so that's they're, true. They're, we, they're, can't, we can't require, Ma can't require, we can't require the dogs to be registered. They may come from Massachusetts or you said most of your... Uh, out of state, yeah. Uh, most of yours mass, are out of state. Mass is, I mm -hmm. get a lot of mass customers. So, okay. Representative Gibbs again. Yeah. Thank you. Um, would you believe that a Chihuahua can be a service dog? For instance, um, there are people who suffer seizures of various types, and there are dogs that are trained, and I cannot tell you how this works, but I know that this, this, this is factual. There are dogs that are trained to recognize when a seizure is coming on and therefore in some way bark or do something to warn the person, uh, the dog's owner, uh, that the seizure is coming on and thereby the person could, for instance, sit down or lie down on the floor and avoid getting injured. So this is, is, is more complicated uh, than it appears, 
Um, and also, uh, would you believe that while it is legal to ask what task the uh, dog is trained to perform, that is different from asking what the disability is that the dog is trained to assist, and it is not legal to ask uh, what the disability is. Thank you. Okay, so let me say, okay, um, juvenile diabetes, dog is trained to smell, smell your blood sugars. That's right. Okay, so you're going to say, so what is the dog, what is the dog capable of doing? The dog is capable of, of smelling whether I'm having a diabetic attack. You can't ask the person to say, show, show me your insulin. <laughs> Show me that you really do have juvenile diabetes. No, you really can't. I think there's nothing we can do to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess we'll look at your amendment and see if that's Take somewhere we can chase. But yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, Thank you. Yeah, I think the uh, just looking at this um, uh, printout, uh, the fine twelve hundred dollars. Can you just post that? As far as I know, it's it it. it um, uh, and and I did. If you, there's a, a sheet of uh, near the back, it's a full page um, that you know I did locate. And uh, one one of the uh, the cabin owner does post this now. Okay. Yeah. It's sitting on the counter on the front desk, okay. even 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 if nobody's ever been right. fined under this provision. Right. But somebody had a decent idea to at least. Yeah. Well, this is great. I got there. two customers I can email this picture to <laughs> before they decide to get too mad at us for our decision. All right. Thank you very much. Well, your... thank you for considering okay. this. And go One ahead. Question. We... Oh, we do have another question, yeah. Representative Spear. What, what does disruption mean? I've been in restaurants where dogs have just started barking and barking and barking, and they're wearing the vest. I remember one dog specifically wearing the vest, but it's just sitting there barking and barking, and it's kind of annoying to everybody. And very aggressive. That ain't a what service animal. If it's barking, it's not a service animal. I mean, excuse me, it's not a, it's not a real, a real. Oh, no. everybody knew it wasn't real, but how do you kick them out? You tell them, say it's a twelve hundred dollar fine. Yeah, I mean, I think it's time for you and your your dog leave. Otherwise, uh, we will pursue this twelve hundred dollar fine. R restaurants are allowed to allow. Our, uh, animals into their facility it's their choice and we're not trying I, I you know I'm not trying to address those that that uh, may have a policy to allow I'm talking about dogs. the disruption dogs yeah okay. I mean um, okay go ahead Representative Walsh uh, I guess my question is even with this and in representative Spears example what is the business owners recourse to to go through with this because they would have to prove that that dog wasn't a service dog so how do you go about doing that representative gibbs uh thank you um again i i think i can help out a little bit with the earlier point about disruption mm -hmm. and speaking from um uh having worked with this issue regarding housing and that is while a uh, landlord cannot exclude either a service animal or uh, a comfort animal for a genuine disability uh, if the animal misbehaves, uh, for instance, barks all night and keeps all the, all the other tenants up or uh, does its business um, on the walkway and the owner doesn't remove it uh, in a reasonably prompt fashion, uh, all of those things would be violations of the lease and the landlord could take the normal actions that a landlord could take uh, regarding any violations of the lease. So similarly, um, if the um, uh, service dog uh, interferes with the normal operations of the business, um, the owner would have the rights that the owner would normally have. I hope that's helpful. I, I would add, you can do the same thing to an unruly patron, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Call the police. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mike Summers, representing the Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association, is in support of the bill. 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mike Summers. I'm the President and CEO of the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association. Uh, from the uh, breadth of the discussion, I'm, I'm sure you're surprised we're in support of this. This has been a massive challenge for our industry to deal with over the last number of years, but particularly since the pandemic, it has just uh, spiraled into a massive issue for, for our business members. Um, a lot of good discussion with the committee, but I'd, I'd like to kind of give a couple of examples and kind of walk you through some things. And I'm not going to purport that I know what the answers to this problem are, but I will tell you that, that it is a very uh, significant problem. So uh, a couple of things that were brought up specifically that, you know, uh, somebody comes to your front desk as a restaurant and they present that they have a service animal. Obviously, our, our members, and, and by the way, we put out regular communications on this particular issue because we get phone calls on this issue all the time. Um, and so, you know, they will ask the two questions. Is this a service animal? The answer is always yes. It's funny how few people show up and say no. And then the question is, uh, so uh, what, what service does this animal perform for you? And usually, immediately, you will know whether or not it's a service animal because the people that ha it is a legitimate service animal are happy to have that discussion with you. They understand the challenges of business. The animals are well-behaved. It's usually not a problem with those folks. It's the folks that are coming in with their pets or, you know, so-called uh, comfort animals. Um, they get up in arms and they start stamping their feet and they huff and they puff and they carry on. Um, I'll share a story with you in a minute of an instance, which I thought was just uh, even above and beyond that. But um, but there's a couple of issues that arise from this, right? So as a, as a restaurant, you have a food license. Under state statute, if you have a food license on your premises, you cannot have anything other than a service animal in your restaurant. A couple of years ago, the legislature did uh, uh, allow for dogs in outdoor patio areas, but it had to have outdoor access. It could not go through the restaurant. So that puts these restaurants in rather a quandary because if they allow something in that this person said, yes, it's a service animal, this for this animal does X for me. We can't ask anything beyond that. Now you have an animal in the restaurant that uh, is doing goodness knows what, eating from plates, you know, defecating. There's all kinds of things that happen. And so, you know, obviously at that point, the restaurant can take some action to then eject the, the person. But the real issue with us from there is social media. Now you're getting tried in the court of public opinion. And, you know, people don't bother to share that it's not really a service animal. I just want to take my pet to lunch, right? No, they, it's always a case of, you know, we ejected, et cetera, et cetera. Usually it triggers some sort of an investigation. Um, it creates a huge headache for, for our business members. Um, you know, I spoke to a gentleman yesterday who shared a story with me that I'll share with you. But he said that, you know, since the pandemic, you know, prior to the pandemic, over his busy summer season, he might have two or three service animals. Now it's every day and sometimes two and three times a day. And it's to the point where people will, even after he said, nope, we don't allow anything other than service animals in here, that they go around the building and they're trying to toss them over the fence into the uh, outdoor patio area, even though he said, we don't allow that. Um, but it, this is the story he shared with me yesterday, and he was obviously quite upset about it. And this happened last summer. But he said that he had a woman come to the front desk and represent that she had a service animal. He asked the question, well, what does this uh, animal uh, perform for a service? And she just started huffing and puffing and said, I'm going to call the police and da, 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 da. Never did answer the question. He said, well, I welcome. And by the way, he has the sign in the window that says there's a $1,200 fine for misrepresenting your animal. So she called the police. The police came filled out a report, said she claims it was a service animal. He claims that it's not a service animal. They've denied entry, et cetera. And so uh, the owner of the business asked the police officer, so what, what happens now? And he's like, it's out of my hands. It's a civil matter. So as a police officer, he can't do anything about it either, which I think really gets to the heart of the problem. We have a $1,200 uh, fine on the books that nobody actually enforces. So I'm not even sure what the recourse of the business owner is at that point. But to take it a step further, uh, on or about November 1st, he said he received a letter from an attorney saying that uh, they, he needed to uh, send a check for $30,000 to placate this woman and make the problem go away, or they would bring in the federal authorities. So he reached out to his attorney. So now he has attorney costs. He's got time, effort, and resources invested in this thing. Ultimately, his attorney advised him not to do anything because ultimately it looked like this was a case of somebody misrepresenting. Of course, he's heard nothing since. But, but you understand the frustration of a business owner who now has dedicated, I can't even tell you how many hours, uh, you know, heartburn, 
uh, police officers times and you have you know the you have uh, social social uh, issues or costs involved you have attorney's fees threats he's so this poor business owner is just trying to run a restaurant but this is what he's dealing with you know and it happens on the hotel side just as frequently if not more frequently um and now you have a situation where you know most res uh, hotels would they make attempt to if they have service animals try to keep them in certain rooms so that you don't have these allergy issues you can't you can't restrict them from being in a specific room, but most of them are pretty accommodating and they they're fine. So you know, you try to limit it to you know twenty percent of your rooms, um, but then obviously you have these situations where you know people are showing up with pets, they're sneaking them into rooms. Now you have a room that you thought was allergen friendly is not allergen friendly. Then you have a lawsuit that comes from that. So this is a major headache for industry. Um, I don't. Again, I don't pretend to have the answers to this problem, but I, I, I really wanted to testify on behalf of the industry because outside of a few wage and hour issues, this is becoming rapidly becoming one of the number one issues for our business members to deal with. So um, I would uh, strongly urge you to uh, essentially develop this uh, study committee. Let's work on this issue. Let's get s some smart people in a room, uh, You know, bring all the stakeholders into the room to, to try to figure out. I don't know if there's anything we can do, but frankly, I think it would be fantastic if we could do something. Even if it was as simple as somebody was in, in, empowered to enforce the $1,200 fine, I think that would be a huge step forward because right now it's a, it's a statute that has no teeth. And to add on to one question earlier, the um, the placard that was uh, mentioned in previous testimony, um, I think it was a year or two ago, the legislature actually authorized uh, Department of Health and Human Services Food Safety Division to develop those placards and share them with the industry. We send them out on a regular basis, at least once a quarter, um, to put them in the windows, have them on display, et cetera. And clearly that has done nothing to help us. Uh, I'll also say uh, two last quick points. The first one is one of the issues that we deal with as an industry is obviously we have a lot of out-of-state visitors. And in some states like Massachusetts, they've given protections to comfort animals. Well, then people from Massachusetts think that the comfort animal is therefore it's the same thing as a service animal. It is not. And so now we have to explain those situations. So that's a problem that, you know, sometimes it works out, sometimes not so much. Um, forgot my last point. So, oh, and the other issue is the retail sector has really compounded this because they basically said, uncle, we're not going to deal with it. Bring all the animals you want into the building. Well, so that has just made it even worse because now they think that they have free right to take their animals anywhere they please and there is no restrictions. When in actual fact, it actually creates problems for particularly restaurant owners with their food safety license. All right, I will get off my soapbox and thank you for your time. Happy to try to answer any questions. Um, so, but the, the idea that that we have all the smart people <laughs> in the room is a great idea, uh, but uh, we're not ones to reinvent the wheel. So um, before we take action on this bill, can you find some state law, find some other state? I will do my best. Yes, I do. Because uh, I, I do... know I, the idea of creating this, you know, study committee and and have them go through all this and angst and knowing, you know, that that it's not to me it sounds unsolvable. But it's a, it, and I and obviously I have firsthand yeah. experience with it. And, but and, so I, it, it, some some state has got to solve it. If they haven't, then then it it seems like uh, a, a, an act of futility to have this. I, I will uh, yes, and I will do some due diligence, and I will see what I can find and bring back to you. Uh, hopefully, kind of move this forward. But um, I will also say that uh, based on your personal example, right. um, I suspect that could have become a problem if they were actually service animals because you're renting it out to the public, therefore it kind of changes the rules under the ADA, correct? Um, smarter people than I may be able to answer we that. We would better. hold out that we're a house, we're a home. <laughs> we, Just as you know that, that discussion <laughs> when it comes to vacation <laughs> rentals, which we'll be continue to discuss in this committee. Okay, Representative Ammon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just curious if you have seen the amendment and if you had any. I have not seen the amendment. I do not have an opinion on it at this okay. point. Yes, but I plan to get a copy and review. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Representative Bertelli. Clarifying question, please. Until, so I just want to make sure I understand. Until some of the federal laws are updated that we're in this kind of uh, precarious position that we're really not able to make any effective changes that would not exacerbate the problem. Is that a fair statement? That's where you're getting into legalese and not being an attorney. I don't want to you know, necessarily speak out of turn. 
I suspect that certain broad parameters will not, you can't really necessarily mess with those. What I'm not sure about is can you enforce what you're on your books, AKA the $1,200 fine for misrepresenting an animal, uh, you know, licensing registration type scenarios. Are there other activities that could take place that would ease the burden and or uh, deter folks from misrepresenting at least to some degree uh, versus where we are right now. And again, I'm not an expert. I, I can't really speak to that, but I would hope that there might be some small steps we could take to mitigate this issue. Representative Gibbs, now, am I got it right? This here where it says here, Office of Governor's Commission on Disability? Is that you? Uh, no, that was not me. Uh, I was director of the New Hampshire Commission for Human Rights. The Governor's Human. Commission on Disability is meant to advisory. The Commission for Human Rights actually enforces the anti-discrimination law under state law. Okay. Um, what I was going to, to ask, um, uh, in reference to the proposed study committee, uh, as it is um, stated in the original version of the bill, uh, it refers to membership being members of the House and the Senate. And what I was going to ask is, would it be um, would it be agreeable to you if, um, in addition to members of the House and the Senate, there were to be uh, representatives of stakeholders, for instance, uh, representatives of the hospitality industry and also representatives of the disability community as specifically uh, a, a representative of the Governor's Commission um, uh, on Disability and also a representative of an organization such as Granite State Independent Living. Frankly, we'd have no issue with that. I think uh, all those stakeholders would likely be involved in the committee hearings themselves. So I think, you know, tomato, tomato. But but if you do that, I would also encourage that we include somebody from the retail sector because that obviously is a huge issue for them as well. Although most of them have just conceded the high ground at this point. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you very much. Okay, having no more cards for... 117. You want to check to see if there's anything blue sheets on there, Representative Grassy? Okay. We will close the public hearing on 117. Okay. Last bill. Uh, does anybody know who represented Al Alwan Al Alward? 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 Did it, did I get one that's saying that this bill wasn't necessary anymore? Did I get a message from? The, I think this. Did I, I get some? Oh, okay. Maybe that was the first one. <laughs> right, so, and they're not here. I wouldn't even know how I'm talking about it. Oh, that's right, they make you introduce it. <laughs> right, didn't you do a farmer's market bill? There's been quite a few farmer's market bills. Is anybody here to talk about it? There's nobody here to talk about it. Nobody here. Nobody. That, that would be the, uh, that would be Jasper. Just to put it on the thing, I'll introduce who is in there. There's only one sponsor and no co, and nobody's here. Uh, but I think I did, I'm pretty sure I did get, yeah, so you said that I got an email or did we all get that email or did I forward it all to you? There's one from Amanda. That's what Tim is referring to. Oh, okay. Let me see. Let me see. I Let me type this name in. A Y L W A O D. No results. Oh, you did. You did get one Thursday from me. You just got Okay. That's what I did. How about the bill number? I want to see. I was looking in the wrong account.
Okay, we'll open up the public hearing in, on House Bill 1090 and hear from Representative Cole. Good morning, Representative Cole. You do have to fill out a pink card, by the way. I'll make sure I do that, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, right away. Thank you. For the record, Representative Cole, House Bill 1090 FN, repealing the requirement to register a farmer's market as a trade name. I'd like to recommend ITL. Any questions? Based on the sponsor's. Based on the sponsor's recommendation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chairman, do we, do we have any idea um, what the original intent was? Because in principle, it doesn't sound like a terrible idea to repeal a requirement to register farmer's market as a trade name. Like that sounds like maybe a good thing, but I have no idea on the background of this bill. Okay, so it. evidently I did receive this January 7th. Is that the one you're- Yes, the yeah. sponsor. Okay, so uh, I, I, so did I forward that to you? you did, yeah. Okay, so I forwarded it to you. So you actually have this yeah. already. Shazam. And it says, uh, the Hampshire House of Revenue Trade and Commerce, uh, HB 1090, repeal of a statute relating to trade name register. My dear honorable chairman and committee members, amendment to HB 1685 related to homeowner foods and definition of a farmer's market were recently made, and as a result, the proposal to repeal is no longer necessary. The statute needs to remain as is in the grand scheme of proposed homemade food laws and the farmer's market definition reform. Therefore, I will not be introducing 1090 and requesting that the committee vote ITL. Thank you for your kind consideration of this request. Deborah, do I have to, does somebody have to move this? Could we, could we just move okay, this? Okay, so, um, <laughs> is there, I, I document that I need to. Oh, we can't do we this. Can do it when we okay. All right, fine. <clears throat> okay. okay, we're done. So, um, I, just so everybody knows, I've always had the habit of um, not uh, disagreeing with the idea of killing a bill on the same day as the hearing. I've always said every bill should have 24 hours um, before it gets the death knell. So, so at this point, you know, we do, when we do have our exec session, um, I, I, I partly thought of, about doing an exec session for Thursday afternoon, but I'm not think that's going to happen. Um, we will be executing next week. Okay. And I haven't figured out exactly what our calendar is, but I would, at this point, I'm going to say, um, that would probably will schedule subcommittees for Wednesday morning and then exec on Wednesday afternoon. Okay. And so therefore, and, and the bills that I'm with Zach is certainly all the early bills. I want to get all, you get all the early bills out of, out of committee. Um, and, um, so uh, if you, you still have that original spreadsheet I sent out, it does say early, which ones are the early bills. Um, I think we pretty much have done all the subcommittees on them, but I will make sure that we will have done those. Um, I know we're, you know, we are doing some subcommittee, um, obviously this afternoon. Nothing on Tuesday. And said, so I will schedule for Tuesday. So Tuesday, I would say, um, I still want to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Do do? I'm still want to stick to that program. Um, and at this point, I would try. I know um, we're down to one day left of of hearings. So I'll look and see what we have for stuff to exact. Make sure we have enough. You know, get the early bills out on Wednesday. Okay. If not, if there's and like the cannabis bill, I'm just to have a just to play play this out loud. The cannabis bill probably will have another subcommittee, okay? And so that would be, we would either do that Tuesday or do that Wednesday morning, but that would be cutting it down, cutting it close for executing it, so I might not do it that way. Um, we're really in no pressure now to do and that. So that last day, that's, that's day number nine. So after that, then we've done all our hearings, which is... Uh, remarkable that we we able to do it so efficiently, um, and uh, so but so I would just say be 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 planning on next Tuesday and Wednesday, there will be subcommittees, potentially hearings, 
potentially maybe a half days of hearings, um, and then and then we will be, but definitely we'll exec, I would say Wednesday afternoon. Now, um, having said that, it would be helpful if anybody who wants to uh, bills that we have that we're going to be executing to know who would like to make the motion. Uh, you know, you know, those of you on that subcommittees that that help, it would be. You can make a motion. It would be helpful. Um, so anyone who wants to um, take make the motions, please let me know. Um, and but I have been ordered in no uncertain terms that if you do make the motion, you're not allowed to leave the room until you've written the blurb. So <laughs> that is. I, I, <laughs> Am I am I quoting correctly? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure it'll be up to the chairman's discretion. <laughs> so, normally I would, would I would say you know write it you know go home write it on your computer and send it to me, but um, they want to be very strict about this about getting these blurbs done on time because evidently other committees have been very sloppy about that. So what I would urge you again and and if you really want to make my day, look at those bills that we're going to sub. And decide which ones you want to let me know and write the blurb ahead of time. And that way you can email me uh, as we exec it and that and then we won't neither one of us will get in trouble for not getting it done on time. Do you want us to email you that we want to write on something or yeah, make do a it motion? on your computer? Right. If you if you if you like to make the, the motion. We can do it by email to tell you. You just tell me A you want to do it and B send me Send me a blurb. It should be people from the subcommittee. And, you know. Okay. Okay. Then I just heard that um, I will be looking to you to be making some motion. Uh, you or your members will be making motions to take up action. On. Okay. I mean, I think I can think of. I can think one that's that. That you guys made the motion on the we would we would be executing on Wednesday. Okay. Okay. So certainly on Tuesday I'll be, you know, trying to gather up because I wanna, you know, do a do a be able to get out early on Wednesday because we'll have everything exact and get it done okay. quickly. All right. Any other? Okay, so I guess we're done for hearing today. And and uh, if you want a real entertainment, come back at one fifteen for cannabis. All right.
in the room. We will uh, invite him to come up and speak uh, because he was the chair of the Cannabis Commission that uh, started this whole thing, this whole ball rolling. So, good afternoon, Senator Abbas. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Darrell Abbas. I represent District 22, serving the communities of Pelham, Salem, Axon, and Plastow. Uh, I was the chair of the commission this summer. I had the privilege of sitting with Representative Hunt, Representative Sullivan. That, am I, I'm missing anyone that's on the committee, but I want to thank everyone for hearing me out today. Anyway, I did go back and it was strongly recommended. I watched the last uh, hearing in this committee about what the commission did and did not do and what, and I feel like I could, since I was there, I could provide you some insight on what was talked about. So initially we were looking at a state control model, basically mirroring the liquor system. And we kind of transitioned that to a franchise model. Now I will say that you can call it whatever you want, but if it's an agency outlet, my understanding that getting, when you get all these people on the same page and from different different chambers, different bodies, different branches of government, and you start changing provisions, the problem is the whole house of cards collapses. There's provisions in here that I'm not necessarily supportive of, not my first choice, but it was part of a very difficult compromise that has been more than a year in the making. So even if something's in here that, I, I'll give you an example, the 15 stores, not my favorite provision. My understanding is if you deviate from that to even 16, this whole thing will fall apart. I just, that's how it is. Uh, the number was lower. We got it up to 15. So you can imagine how that was working out. So the idea is to start slow and you can always expand on that. But if you move too fast, you can't really go backwards. So really it's erring on the side of caution. Uh, the future legislators will always be allowed to change that number as they see fit. We won't have, these stores won't realistically open within the next uh, couple of years anyway. So it's not something that's, I would say, an urgent thing to deal with, but the dual use concept, uh, we as a commission were very clear that we were not gonna go in that direction to allow the dual use license for both a therapeutic facility and a retail store. Instead, what we decided was why not allow every retail store to sell therapeutic grade products? It would kind of make sense that you would have it that way. We didn't, we didn't want um, any retailer to have an unfair market advantage over another one. And that was where the disagreement was being raised. So when we discussed that, it said, well, would that benefit the ATC program? Perhaps, because they'll have more uh, places to distribute their product. It seemed like we would limit manufacturing. They would kind of be grandfathered in as the only manufacturers of therapeutic grade product. But that kind of put us in a position where not one single retailer had a market advantage over the other. Uh, when, you're, when you're a franchisee and you have a franchisor, you're kind of all working together as a team. And you really don't want one to have be superior to the other. Uh, we, we were not going to legislate, and it was, I think the commission was in full agreement. We were not going to guarantee any individual or entity a license to be a franchisee. Now, there is a criteria in place for what it would take, that what would be to put, take into consideration. I believe when uh, the very first hearing we had, uh, the, uh, the chairman of the, the Liquor Commission came in and testified to what that criteria would look like. It, on paper, an ATC would obviously be very favorable to that, but it wasn't going to, we weren't going to legislate and guarantee an entity a license, when, especially when you're going to limit the amount of licenses. We thought that, that wasn't good legislation. If we put that in any other context, I mean, any one of you want a license, I might want to, I might want to be a franchisee. That would be absurd to put that into legislation. But if we go down that road, we felt that that was not the right way to go. So, would they be a great candidate? Yes. And the reason why they're a great candidate, obviously they have experience, but also if you look at, if you're the, the franchisee and you're in, in the same town or same vicinity as a ATC, that's a, that's a market competitor. All right. You would be basically, essentially, if they were to voluntarily be asked to become a, a retail store, they're choosing to go that direction you're essentially, you're not limiting your competitor, but when it comes to the branding identity of what the stores would look like, it would protect that brand. You didn't want some of your franchisees to have these two stores or dual stores inside there and others not. Again, that was the unfair market uh, 
unfair market competition. <clears throat> My understanding was that was what the agreement was. When I say agreement, that was where we all came to a consensus. And that was not something that was opposed at the time by the ATCs. That was my understanding. I thought since it went sounded so sure that I, I was wrong. I asked other people on the, on the members of the commission. We seem to all had the same understanding what, what that was. So things change. No one's, it's not signed in blood that you have to stick to it, but that was what the arrangement was. Uh, we came to that. And I believe it's Mr. Chairman, you were the one that said you can only can have one master. And the problem you're running into is some when it came to enforcement of some of the thera the rules that apply to the therapeutic facilities, if liquor was in, uh, the liquor commission is now in charge of enforcement, they should be involved in the in drafting some of the rules. So it, it kind of became what happens if you have a conflict. It, it kind of be, the overlap there was really something of a concern. Uh, some language that we came up with after the commission concluded its work was if there was a conflict uh, between the rules that you would have. Uh, liquor's rule would supersede the therapeutic rule, just so there's a clear understanding of what is in, in effect uh, when you're dealing with, with um, the retail stores. So that's what the arrangement that we came to was. Now, I understand that there's a lot of people that have a different ideas how they would do this. I would do it differently. Mr. Chairman, I know you would do it differently if, if it was just you. We disagreed on a lot of things during that commission hearing, but ultimately we came to a consensus on what we were going to go forward with. I will say proceed with caution by changing the number 15 by changing this to agency as opposed to franchise stores in my opinion the whole thing falls apart it doesn't matter which one you think is better i haven't gone through this yet i'm, I'm sure there's plenty in here that i'll i like this probably things i would have done differently i'm just suggesting by changing it it does fall apart uh and it's not me that you have to convince uh in order to support this so with that being said um, I'll take any questions. If anyone has, wants to ask me anything about what else the commission did, I will just say one last one last part of this. Uh, as part of that agreement, the therapeutic products, when they're sold in the retail stores, also can be subject to the royalty share. So the revenue would have actually been higher. I estimated about 15, 20% market share. Uh, it seemed to make sense that that would, uh, that would inc obviously increase the state revenue. But at the same time, by having more distribution outlets, for that therapeutic products, it seemed that there would be an increase uh, in sales as well. So it seemed like that was a win-win, at least it was. But on, from what I gather from watching the last hearing, it doesn't seem like that really isn't the agreement anymore. So if we don't have an agreement, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing requiring us to mandate that therapeutic stores become retail stores, if you ask me. Great, uh, Representative Burroughs. Thank you, no. Thank you, Senator, for taking my question. Could you explain why this would fall apart if we had more than 15 or if we went to the um, agency store model? So there was a lot of different people. And a lot of us, I voted against how many cannabis bills as a member of the House. Mr. Chairman, you were there. Representative, you were there. You listened to those long, boring speeches, but I've done it several times. There's a lot of people on both in the House and Senate that have are willing to come to they can willing to consider certain versions of this. The problem is with the agency side of this. Now you have this dual license, you have this unfair market share. The agency stores have different meanings under different laws, especially when you talk about liquor. But if it's not a franchise model, it's if it's an agency store, protecting the brand identity of what the storefront looks like is going is to be different. You don't have as much control over an agency agency store as you would a franchise. And when it, that was what the agreement was, my understanding that the corner office was also on board with the franchise language. I'm not sure how they were how they would react to this agency language, but when things are presented cut and dry like that, that, that changes right. everything. But it would be safe to say we're really not sure exactly what agency store means because all we can think of is agency liquor stores, which I'm clearly sure this bill does not do that. So we'll, we need to delve in, what you're pointing out is we need to delve into figuring out 
what what does that mean? If it just means changing the name from franchise to agency, then then no harm done. If it, if there if there's something else in the details, then that's what we'll need to learn. Yeah, and, and respectfully, Mr. Chairman, if there's no harm done and you're just changing the name, why change it in the first place? Um, I, I guess people don't like the idea of the word franchise because I guess there's federal law around franchise and and they think we're exposing ourselves to a uh, a separate statute that might cause us harm. So what what I would I, what I would say in respect to the fear of enforcement under federal law, we discussed that in the commission. We went over the attorney general's office provides us a lot of instances where the federal government has suggested they would do something all that was presented to us in this franchise model they it, they felt the risk of the feds coming coming down and just cracking down on just New Hampshire and not any any of the other states was uh, reduced by not being a pure state control model but as opposed to the franchise model but you call it agency or franchise for the purposes of of the federal law I don't think anything changes. You're just calling it something different. If that's going to perhaps make people feel better. If people feel better about it, then why not? That's, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to get into the semantics until I find it, out what is actually in this. It, and if, if this is about making people feel better at this point, this, this is not going to work. I just, I'm just going to say all the work, You're fearful of the, of the, all the, the work result. that went into yeah. this, we want to just change the name of something because we like it the way it sounds better. Right doesn't change any of the substance. I, I okay. think we're, Fair we're not doing our job. All right. Representative Spear was next. She asked the question. Okay. So, uh, Rep Representative Bolio. Thank you for taking my question, Senator. Are we here representing the people, the residents in the state, or are we just here supporting the corner office? I'm, I'm here. I, I can answer that question for you. Yes, and please. I, I'm here on behalf of District 22, serving the communities of Pelham, Salem, Axon, and Plastow. Uh, HB 5098 from last term, I did a lot of the drafting to put that into place over a lot of objections, but a lot of people supported it. I'm doing this again, being a border town. My district, from, for the most part, is surrounded by five therapeutic, uh, not uh, therapeutic, excuse me, retail stores in Massachusetts. Uh, if you drive on the main road from uh, Atkinson into Plastow, you cut into one street basically into Massachusetts for a short, you know, quarter of a mile. And there's a therapeutic, uh, excuse me, a retail store right there at that intersection. So I'm looking at it as uh, a lot of the potential negative uh, social uh, impacts of a recreational policy, whatever those may be, we may disagree on what those are. I'm already dealing with those in District 22. That's why I support this. However, getting this over the finish line, it requires us all to work together. So when, when we're working together as a commission, whether you're a, one political party or another, whether you're a member of the House or the Senate, or if you're the executive office, it's working together. It doesn't mean we're beholden to one or the other. So, and if anyone knows me well enough knows that I'm, I'm only beholden to my constituents. Thank you. Okay, Representative Gibbs. Thank you. Uh, in reference to what you said earlier, Senator, regarding um, control of the appearance of stores and so forth, why do we want to control the appearance of stores? Thank you for the question. I think the concept was that if you had a franchise model in your franchise, think of any other, think of a fast food restaurant, the logo, what that does, it cuts down the amount of advertising because you want, we want to limit really the, um, we're going to limit the types of advertising, but also that's the advertising is all going to be done by the state, by the, by the liquor commission. So what, to me, one of the worst parts of the states have gone with a full recreational policy is they have these large bright billboards all up and down the highways that for these retail stores. And that's something personally, I don't support that, but by having them all look the same and have the same branding identity, it makes the marketing much simpler. Also, that's where the royalty comes into place. That's why every McDonald's has the same sign, the same symbol, and there's some restrictions on what the store can look like. Also, what you can sell. There's a reason why a McDonald's doesn't sell, they don't want you selling hot dogs for whatever reason. That's their corporate policy, that's how it is. Uh, further question? Further question? Thank you. Uh, this is not a, you know, a hearing. This is just a uh, conversation that you're trying to 
Yes, you can, but please don't make it a hearing. Okay. Okay. Um, you said that um, uh, it would make the marketing uh, simpler um, to control the appearance of the stores, but since the most recent version of the bill, as I understand it, basically forbids advertising um, and just about any other form of marketing, uh, then it, it, is that does that argument still apply? So the idea is that any marketing towards minors was going to be strictly prohibited. To the extent there would be any advertising, it would be done and controlled by the state. That's part of what their operation would be. Now we didn't we didn't draft comprehensive rules or anything yet because, again, we were there was we kept kind of switching directions on which which road we were going to go down with putting together a rec policy. But the advertising side of things, we just figured if you did have any type of promotional material that every franchise a franchisee would benefit from that promotion and this also where i thought the the market would go is the money side of things is really the individual products think of any liquor you know you, you name your liquor right they, they don't own a storefront it's their label on their product that's where this eventually goes our new hampshire liquor stores have all the same sign same type of logos if you see that. So it's kind of mimicking the infrastructure we have. It's not going to be exactly the same, but we're following that that route. But as I as I understand it, the latest version of the bill forbids advertising altogether, not just advertising to minors. So again, if advertising is forbidden, does that argument still apply? Well, I don't I'm not sure if it's where it says that in and I'm I'm assuming we're looking at the same draft, not the amendment that was File today. So yeah, where where are you referring to? But if it says that, I I'm not against any form any, of advertising. But again, that's something that that's a minor detail that I think we can work out. I think where it gets gets more controversial is the types of advertising you're going to do. All right, I, I'm going to interject here. Okay, Representative Spear, do you have a question to me? No, I have a question. Uh, I, I'm done with him. You talk to me. All right, I'll ask you. Yes. Why did the uh, when you handed out the amendment, yes, I this it is didn't represent Leo's. No, not that one. The one you handed out, okay. which is the one we understood came from their originally from the commission. Right. Correct. It had nothing in there about uh, ex exonerating people uh, with annulment. possession annulment or anything like that. Issue. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the commission intentionally left that out because the uh, even with the legislation, marijuana wouldn't be legal. In terms of having, you know, of selling in illegally of design would be for another two years, anyways. So the issue was that the commission was more focused in passing legislation to dealing with the issue of how we're going to sell it, how we're going to allow licensed many you know, the cultivators doing all that, assuming that in the interim, before it actually was being sold, in that meantime that to judiciary committees who know much more about legal process would have worked out the annulment issue. That was the same thing we had in our, we had this conversation in this committee a year ago that I said this, I don't want to do that annulment. We don't know, Congress doesn't know anything about annulment. We don't know how to do that. And we can, that's okay to let go because it's not going to change anything in the next two years because we won't actually have legal marijuana in the state. I, w I will tell you that there's been some progress with that. So keep in, keep in mind, we're up against a, a deadline. We didn't have the summertime to actually meet that the commission wasn't formed to the end of the summer. So we didn't, we couldn't do anything in July and August. The language that was in HB 639 that uh, we had to work with, that required the court to vacate every single possession conviction period. The problem is the court doesn't really have a mechanism to go looking for cases from 1970, 1960. The, the way the annulment process works is someone comes in and they apply for it. They fill out a piece of paper. That's how they know where to find the file. So th the language as written was not something that would really work, despite how well intended it was. But on the last day of the commission, and we figured we weren't going to have time to focus on that because it wasn't really the charge of the committee, 
but uh, the rep the person designated by the ACLU basically clarified the annulment language to mimic what we already have, but change the eligibility to the possession limits that would be in whatever legislation we passed, which is something that I was willing to support. But we didn't have time to really to, uh, work that out in the in the commission. But in the ACLU's here, they can tell me if I'm I'm wrong. But that that's my understanding is at least for my sake, I was okay with the language that was. Been proposed, and I passed that around to the chairman as well. So but. you feel in general that the, uh, uh, if we ever did come to an agreement, right, that uh, the fact that there isn't anything in there about the annulment now, that doesn't mean we won't be able to put uh, and something I'm, in. Is, is something an annulment in this amendment? So yeah. that's a non-issue at this point. Annulment. If we're taking, if we're discussing this amendment, which one are you holding up? I'm holding up Representative Lynn's 0337. All right, and at this point, this is the, the, the sponsor's bill, this is the sponsor's amendment, okay. and at this point, this is the only one I'm discussing. Okay, so there is because an element in there. Because if we don't pass this amendment, or we don't work with this one thing, get this one baby done, we're not going backwards. Okay. We're not going to look at anything else. This is this is it. Good. Okay? It's not really Got it. I, he is <laughs> telling us what happened in the commission. Okay. Yeah. I so also just take the amendment the when I walked in. So he is telling where we left off, where we were when it came to December. Okay. I, I only it, read the first two pages of the thirty so, something pages, so I don't want to so, speak on it without it, reading yeah, it. So let's just deal with this document. Okay. Oh, All right. Because he was the commission that was in charge. But we're done with that. Okay. It, I'm I, sorry. I, I, I guess it, she doesn't want to matter, hear any more from you. I think she's heard. She's enough. all done with you. Thank you very much, Senator. All right. <laughs> I appreciate the warm welcome. <laughs> I, I, Mr. Chairman, if I can just say one thing. Uh, in respect for myself, I wouldn't support any legislation that mandates that any person or entity gets a license. That's just me. I say it again. You wouldn't... I would not support any legislation that mandates or that any one person or entity receives a license by operational law license for to become a retail store I, oh I right, right. Needs, you, you want a limited license a little bit of a hint okay if you ask me right I, I guess uh and and represent lane is here to introduce the bill so i guess i i, I have to say where i'm coming from because you posed a, a what i consider a very awkward question i mean are we here for the governor okay no. so it, in in reality is I am and you know why because I have voted for marijuana bills I have voted for multiple marijuana bills and they all died okay and when one of the reasons they died is because the governor's threat of veto and the governor says hey I would sign if you did something like this, I'm going to pay attention. No, maybe you don't want to pay attention. Maybe you think, well, he's a Republican and I don't care about him. Okay. But I, rep I will pay it. I, if it was John Lynch saying the same thing when he vetoed marijuana and he said, I think I would sign this. I would still pay attention. I don't care what you say about do I'm doing this for my constituents. Most of my constituents have no clue and frankly don't really have to care because there are two marijuana stores that are, are less than five minutes drive away from their homes. Okay. So this it's really not about my constituents. It is about, yes, I believe the state of New Hampshire should have marijuana available. Okay. And I think it's high time that we pass something. And so, yes, I'm going to pay attention to those guidelines, those guardrails, as we like to call them, that were presented by the governor. Now, if you want to say, yes, no, I just want to pass what I want to pass, that's, at this point, have at it, guys. There's been a lot of work. We're, I, you know, and everybody keeps saying, you've worked so hard on this, John. Okay, but my opinion doesn't matter, Okay. What matters right now is can we put something together that we can get out of this committee, we can get out of Ways and Means, get it over to the Senate, and have something that the Senate, I assume, will be mucking around with it, and then we can decide when it comes back to us whether we can live with it or not. 
And if we can, we'll concur. We send it to the governor's desk. And I would assume most of us would hope that he won't veto it. And that's a lot of a lot of bites at the apple. Exactly. Please. Thank you. Meryl. Okay. Okay. Now we're ready, Representative. <laughs> I would say, um, normally I would say, let's go through this, but I, I ask you, could you start by showing us what's in here about the agency so that we all we all are on the same page when we talk about agency versus franchisee. So you can you tell us what where in here is the differences between the two so we have an idea. John, can I ask you one question based yes. on what you just said? Yes. Assuming we wanted to be very practical and we wanted to get something through regardless of what it is. Not regardless. I mean, obviously you could say, no, I don't want anything, and then that's the end of that. Yeah. Whatever. We have plenty of people who don't want to vote for any marijuana bill. I'm not talking about that. Okay. If we were to go to a specific, because both bills have a very different model. We don't know that. We have, we've got about to find out. We're about to find out what an agency model well, means. Well, some of us have looked at this. And you know exactly already. the difference between an no, agency and No, not exactly, but okay. I know a little bit. Well, I we, don't. We've seen I, some stuff yesterday. Okay. Somewhat different model, Okay. I can understand that in the future we could change the number of stores. We could change what the stores look like. We can change anything and everything except but that if, model. <laughs> but the model, that we, will, we would not be, ever be able to go back on that. No, that's actually not necessarily true because it would take, a while, uh, take over a year before anything to be in place. You think so in that time frame that, before it that, becomes... That I, I'm pretty sure, well, unless he's changed the 18 months. But the first license of, of a retailer wouldn't be issued until 18 months. That's where it was. I don't know if it still is. So if that's still true, that means we have a whole nother legislative year to second guess ourselves and, and change it. We would actually have next year to change anything that came to how it was retailed. And so actually, to me, one of the important things why we really want to pass something is that we want to get the cultivators going. We want to get those cultivator licenses out there. And as far as I heard, there is not much debate about cultivators license. So the sooner we get them out there, the sooner we'll know we'll have product to sell so we can actually have stores. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank Senator Abbas for all the work that he's done on this. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to try and join that commission, but it was a very challenging year for my family, and I didn't want to commit to something where I wouldn't be able to attend the meetings. Um, with that said, um, I heard a lot of the concerns that he had, and I wanted to start off by addressing those with how it's in the amendment and then walk through those changes so you can understand exactly what is proposed. Um, so his first question was um, around the concern about any retailer being able to sell. It was about the market advantage for the ATCs if they were able to open up a storefront. Um, within, the, within the way that we have set up, um, actually, you know what? That gets so deep into how I'm doing it, I'm going to pause on that one. Let's go back to the branding and identity issues. Um, we would be getting doing away with any of that billboard advertising and enacting a fine so that even if out of state uh, retailers were advertising in New Hampshire, they would not be able to do that so that our kids wouldn't be driving around and asking mom, hey, mom, what's cannabis? because it's on the billboards. So this would be something where at least inside the state of New Hampshire, nobody would see a billboard and there wouldn't be any general purpose advertising. It would allow a uh, listing on weed maps, it would allow anything in publications that are related to cannabis so that anybody who's seeking out cannabis, most people know that there are publications that you can go to. They were in large circulation well before it was legal anywhere in the country. And even if somebody has only passing interest in cannabis, um, there's a lot of knowledge that you can seek out those locations. So the idea of having a market that grows slowly and doesn't overwhelm with a whole bunch of novice users, I think that the idea of not having advertising so that we don't have it in front of our kids, so we don't have to worry about how to standardize that between all of the different, all the different operations, 
um, would actually be a big benefit because it would be a slow uptake of those um, existing users or those who simply aren't doing it because it it's not lawful in the state of New Hampshire. It's a small population who are those rule followers, um, but I think let's start small and let's not start with an outreach of advertising. That can always be dealt with in the future once we understand what the market looks like. So the idea of having consistent branding for billboards and for marketing going from a franchise free fee is quite moot if we don't have that advertising. Um, and then secondly, we actually allow, f we provide for rules around the finished quality and experience, exterior of the business and lot signs and logo within the regulation of cannabis so that even without having a franchise model, those would be in the conditions for opening up a retail outlet so that we can still have that consistency so that uh, we don't have Bud's Bud, Bud Barn or anything else that may be offensive to members. Uh, we actually also go uh, further to say no slang or promotion, which encourages overconsumption. So the idea of having a sign with the bloodshot eyes and something else that's encouraging overconsumption just wouldn't fly under the licensed model. We don't need to tell, tell somebody how to operate their business. Um, and if we can tell them that they can't use, you know, crass or vulgar images that are displayed to people outside of their stores. Um, as far as, um, as far as the, I, I guess I'm going to go back to the whole idea of this trying to represent the commission. I have been waiting um, since the bill filing deadline for the Senate and then waiting through December and January, expecting that a bill was going to be filed from the commission with the commission's um, report and with the commission's position. Even though the official report, because people abstained, didn't actually adopt a specific language, I was under the assumption um, that the chairman, um, Senator Abbas, was going to move forward with this so that he would be able to put forward everything that they talked about over the fall, all of the hard work, and to reflect that with a bill going in through the Senate to be able to address the issues in the Senate and then pass it over to the House to see if it was something um, in which we would partake. Um, but unfortunately, we have my bill that I introduced with uh, several other wonderful co-sponsors. We did this because we weren't sure of the outcome of the commission. And that's why what this amendment here today is trying to bring this closer and to meet all of those goals of the corner office while also avoiding those risks which we do truly believe are real about having too much operational control over the stores. So I'll start with the objections um, to the what came out of the commission. Um, the biggest part is the high level of control of operations in the rulemaking authority, which was in 318F6 in that amendment. That included rules on the size and nature of facilities, including store design. It included operation of the franchise cannabis retail outlet. It included discount and compensation. So what discounts you could offer and how much you can pay your employees and the pricing structures for the wholesale price of cannabis and cannabis products. That is dictating the operational uh, procedures, and that is why um, I am so concerned that that model would trigger um, the number two of the franchise definition. To be a franchise, you have a trademark, you have operational control, and then you have those franchise fees. You know, we're going to have that trademark. We're going to have that consistent look of the stores out in front. Um, and we're going to have those fees that are coming through. And we're also allowed to have health and safety regulations and normal government regulations of a business without that falling under a franchise. It's that operational control that is so dangerous. And so that is why we have presented, instead of a franchise model, a cannabis retail outlet. So... Um, the amendment is not a replace all. The amendment left those sections unchanged from the original bill in the original bill, which includes the annulment. But if you want to turn to 318F12, and I'll tell you what page it is as soon as I find that. Sorry, I got this um, at 1215 from OLS when I wasn't sure if I should send out my rough draft uh, for printing. So that is um, 318F12. 
let's see, it's in the definition. Sorry, th- sorry, this one is the definitions. My apologies. I was putting this together with the information. So it's right on page three of the amendment, starting at line 27. It says the cannabis retail outlet or outlet means an entity licensed to purchase cannabis from cannabis cultivation facilities to purchase from manufacturing and limited perf- manufacturers and to sell, transfer, and deliver cannabis and cannabis products to consumers, qualifying patients, and designated caregivers. So within that, that is how we are defining it as that retail outlet. And then there are extensive rules on the op- operation of those retailers that are within the regulation section. So th- so when you look to those, that is where we have the regulation that has, um, that has these guidelines on how they would present themselves to the public. So um, if that's enough of just that general idea, let me give you the walkthrough with my changes and the amendment. I know it's a lot. I know I got it to you late. I had circulated some just with a couple few people just for some proofreading. And we found numbering issues and duplication. So I thank everybody who helped me with that so that I could deliver the best possible product to you today. And so that we're focusing on the issues and not on any of my errors in drafting. So we changed the purpose and findings, which are now um, very reflective of what was in Chairman Hunt's amendment. Um, that's section one of the amendment two and three, just deal with new references that are throughout. And we also adopted the name substance use prevention treatment and recovery fund as chairman hunt did. Um, that's throughout, that's part of section three. Um, we had deleted the change to the drug forfeiture fund because the, the baseline data is being collected elsewhere. So that's an unnecessary reference. Then in, um, section Section five, which is the top of page three, we added harvesting and cultivating to those things which are not illegal because they're permitted by state law. That's consistent with the Hunt Amendment um, and I believe the commission work. So that's definitely one of the well dones there. So then we get to the definitions. Um, The Hunt Amendment had removed vaporizing from cannabis accessories. Um, I believe that's because there's an assumption that we're talking about either little cartridges or the things that look like crayon that we need to make sure that they're being regulated appropriately. Um, I don't believe that includes any of the larger, almost desktop sized things where somebody's doing that in order to avoid impurities, especially if they're particularly concerned concerned about their lungs. so um, those, those larger things, I, I believe, would be fully allowed under the language for inhaling cannabis into the human body. And if there's disagreement about allowing those larger desktop vaporization devices, then we'll need to add that language back in. Um, so we have the cannabis retail outlet. There's a, re- there was a request during the commission and also in Hunt's amendment to add a cannabis distributor. So that's added here, but it specifies that it's not an individual standalone license where only the distributor is allowed to distribute. If you're otherwise licensed, you can do that as part of your licensed activities, but it allows so that if somebody wants to be a distribution di- distribution only enterprise, that would be licensed and permitted. Um, It also has, in in order to provide as many market opportunities for entrepreneurs as possible, it adds a limited production, limited product manufacturing facility. So the biggest danger in the manufacturing is when you're doing extractions with volatile compounds. I did a tour of one of uh, one of the facilities in a neighboring state. And oh my, that is a science project, making sure that it won't explode when you're using volatile gases to do it. Let's leave that to the people willing to take that risk, but allow small markets to develop things with the extracts that they have so that Betty's brownies or anything else that would otherwise be allowed could be a business for somebody to open up. And for that reason, those limited manufacturings would have a $100 non-refundable application fee. We've set an an application non-refundable application fee schedule, but have left the rest of the fees to rulemaking because let's at least get that first line in the sand for where people start. I know on Gelcar, the idea of the non-refundable application fees has been a big topic. So let's take care of that here if we can. Um, Adds designated caregiver, just as Chairman Hunt's amendment did. Um, And we remove everything on home grow for therapeutic cannabis. There's already a separate bill on that. Let's not confuse the issue by including that here. Let's let that live on its own. Um, It also adds the definition of premises from the Hunt Amendment and the therapeutic grade cannabis product. 
Um, so with that, there's we also have a provision for rulemaking that would happen. Oh, sorry, that uh, we would have a provision for the Liquor Commission, the Department of Health and Human Services, Therapeutic Cannabis Program to work together to suggest legislation to either transfer the TCP into the Liquor Department partially or wholly, and then figure out what laws would be required if uh, therapeutic cannabis were to be offered in other retail stores. Um, I think that that would be a huge benefit to everybody so that that therapeutic cannabis could be purchased and sold in those stores. But because there are certain purchasing limits, there's only a certain amount you can buy within 10 days within the therapeutic cannabis program. That is highly complex to roll out to all of these different retail outlets. So that would be something to wait and get that input from the Liquor Commission and the TCP to figure out how to legislatively enact that before these stores are going to, into force. And quite honestly, that seems like a great place for the distributors. So I'm seeing some of these great market niches here. Um, let's see, then the enforcement th authority, we had only had one sub paragraph, sub paragraph in there. We added just about everything from Chairman Hunt's amendment, though we did not allow them to interpret statutes and rules. Um, generally, there's a certain amount that's allowed with a normal practice, but we don't want to supersede the judiciary branch, and we don't want to overstate the roles of the commission. So that language was problematic. So that was removed here. Um, and as was the rules of evidence, you know, we, we could be looking at pretty serious impacts on people um, through the enforcement and the idea of not having the rules of evidence um, seems problematic to me. You know, if that needs to be a later discussion, it can be a discussion, but I rem that was removed because I find that quite troubling. And then we have the Cannabis Advisory Board um, that combines the members of both um, the initial 1633 and the Hunt Amendment, which creates a very large, very, very large advisory board. And we need to make sure that it'll be functional. So there's a few things that uh, reviewing different advisory boards within my committee, Health and Human Services, I've noted are starting to be suggested to make them work better. One is that when somebody's term has expired until somebody else is, is in that position, they can still attend. The question then would be whether or not they're considered part of quorum. You know, that's one of those issues that can be dealt with and be figured out. But I think that allowing them in, unless they are removed for misconduct or for um, absenteeism, I think would be beneficial to the function of the, ad, uh, of the advisory board. There's also the issue of making sure that, that that people actually show up once they're on a commission. I'm on some commissions where sometimes they're not able to meet because either they don't have enough people named or they don't have people showing up. So there's not a quorum just for a regular meeting. So it would define quorum as a majority of those who've been appointed, not a majority of those that, that exist as potential seats to be filled. And it also only requires a quorum for voting so that the whole, the whole advisory board or any subcommittees which are specifically enabled within this are able to do some good work. And that's quite important because one of the areas we charge the advisory board with is looking at new scientific evidence so that that could be incorporated. That's a great thing for a subcommittee. We don't really need 50 million people together discussing that evidence. So let's figure out how to make this functional and beneficial. So it also adds some charges um, and incre increase in outlets or canopy limits, uh, advising on the potential need for a state reference laboratory or collaborating with other states' reference laboratories if that's possible. And um, it removes the advertising oversight because we're not going to have advertising, so it's unnecessary. But it adds the ability to advise on packaging and signage. So now we get to the regulation of cannabis. It's uh, 318F9 in this bill. And... Let me tell you what page that starts on. 11. 11. Thank you very much. Ah, yes, right there in the middle. I wish there were spaces between those uh, those chapters. So this uh, has a timeline between the original and that which is in the Hunt Amendment. Um, there would be rules for dual use within 16 months so that we would know how a dual use would be able to function. And then they can apply to get that dual use certificate. There's rules for cultivation within 18 months so that we can have cultivation sooner. And then rules for licensing and regulation of the cannabis establishments within 20 months. So that makes it so that everybody's ready to come out of the starting gate to apply for those retail outlets um, after that, you know, within 20, within 22 months. The 
there's also a mechanism for selection if there's more than 15 applications for outlets because we left it at the cap of 15. Um, we did say that if there are three ATCs, the three operating ATCs um, have a license that, that an application that would be accepted, that they do get those. They did break the ground here. You know, we don't want to give them an unfair advantage, but we also don't want to kneecap them and make them have to op create a whole new separate store. You know, we need to respect the work that was done while making sure that we're not giving any unfair advantages. And there's quite a few areas in here that we look to make sure that we're not giving them an extra jump on anything either. So we added the disqualifying conditions for licensure from the Hunt Amendment. Um, let's see, there's rules to assess the need for more stores at least each year, geographic restrictions of one per municipality or one for every 15,000 in population in the municipality, and 1,000 feet from schools. It still follows municipal zoning laws. Um, within cultivation rules, it would um, have them develop a canopy cap if that's necessary, and um, both the outlets and cultivators would need to either open or make significant progress and show why they haven't yet opened within a certain time period for their license to remain in effect. Um, that's to prevent anybody from getting a license and sitting on it. You know, this is going to be a really, really small market with only 10 licenses. Um, it's one of those areas where we need to make sure that if somebody has a license, they're actually moving forward and making progress. Yet giving grace, understanding that sometimes the unforeseen happens. Obviously, we would have expected a delay if COVID hit in the middle of this implementation. So there's distribution rules according like the Hunt Amendment, removes the event and special use. There's restrictions on advertising, like logo, signage, and marketing. No general social media marketing, um, as in the Hunt Amendment. No slang or promotion, which encourages overconsumption, which is one of our additions in order to try and quell those fears about what any marketing may have. There's a naming convention where it would be a New Hampshire retail cannabis outlet or a New Hampshire cannabis outlet. It also could be the dairy cannabis outlet since two thirds of people in dairy supported legalization on a recent ballot measure and uh, would allow that if the Liquor Commission approves, you could have a name where it would say uh, John's Craft Cannabis, a New Hampshire cannabis outlet, so that there can be some differentiation so that you know which one that you're going to, but not so much that it creates confusion. You know, when I go to a liquor store, I didn't know until I spoke more to uh, some of the representatives here that the one in London Dairy has an amazing high-end selection, and the one that we've secured in Dairy, we need to show that we have those tastes before we have that liquor selection. Similarly, in stores, in Nordstrom, I had to figure out which one sells clothes like this and which one has more of the urban wear and which is more the soccer mom. When it has the same name, it's kind of hard to know which store to go to to meet your needs. It can still be within the same umbrella and, cl and clarity, but if, instead of saying, oh, you should go to the cannabis store in Epping because that has a wider variety of gummies, and I know you like gummies, you can say, oh, let's go to, I don't even know what a name would be that would be appropriate with gummies with that. But basically, if it was, you know, if it was Sally's Kitchen, um, a New Hampshire cannabis outlet, if that would be acceptable to anybody, then at least you have a little bit more di differentiation. And I see you probably don't like Sally's Kitchen, and I'm okay with that. But some differentiation, because without the advertising, you want to have at least some nuance to those names. Um, we have the, we, we decreased the milligram content for edibles and drinkables to five milligrams, and we added 100 milligram per package, which is an industry standard. Um, I, there are some areas with 200 milligrams per, uh, per packaging, but let's stick with the industry standard of 100. Um, let's see, the packaging and labeling rules from the Hunt Amendment. So there's a prohibition on poly drugs that was already in there, but that specifically adds alcohol so that you're not adding it to alcohol or anything else to make it more intoxicating. Um, there's uh, potency r limits are, are, would be done through rules with advice to the, from the advisory board and public comment. Remediation for testing irregularities, min minimum testing requirements. And that's important because if you have different moisture content when you're testing, uh, apparently you can have a different level of THC in that test. So if we know what our standards are for testing in New Hampshire, and each of those testing labs knows that you need to test at whatever the parameters are to have, have similar and equivalent tests, then we can, those can be set through rules. 
Um, there's also rules on changes in ownership to prevent flipping, but perhaps that should be a little bit tighter. If we only have 15 licenses, if we're not sure it's going to expand, then maybe we want to go to the Chick-fil-A model on that, where if you change ownership, it reverts back. I mean, maybe you can collapse and have somebody leave and have somebody remain with more partnership. I don't know. We get run into problems when we only have 15, but I know that that's what, that's what the governor's looking for. So we'll just try and figure out how to work with that the best we can. Um, it also includes intoxicating hemp to be regulated in a way not less restrictive than cannabis. And as I said before, the Liquor Commission and Department of Health and Human Services Therapeutic Cannabis Program would work to help draft legislation to transfer all or part to the commission and integrate the offer the therapeutic cannabis offerings and non ATC operated uh, outlets. Um, so then in 318 F10, that is where we have the advertising limit prohibitions on advertising cannabis sales. That needs to be in more than just rules because the rules only apply to uh, licensed operators and out of state cannabis operations are not licensed in New Hampshire. So by having a prohibition on those advertisements, um, then and with those fines, that would allow it to have an evil, e equal playing ground, playing field, so that we don't have out of state interest uh, buying up billboards when in state cannot. So and then it has a dual use certificate pathway that is based that should be faster just because we need to make sure that we know what they need to do. They're already in the business. Let's figure out that dual use and then let them can let them enter into that whole process for the retail stores in the same time as everybody else. Um, Licensing procedures to accept and process applications no longer than two months after rules are issued, but extend the 90 days to issue the license to 120 days because there likely will be more than 15 um, applicants. And we want to make sure that there's some time for them to really assess and make any comparisons necessary or to run a lottery and know how they're going to be able to allocate these. You know, we haven't prescribed exactly how they will deal with an excess of applicants, um, but it's quite possible that they will need to deal with that. Um, also in the Hunt Amendment, the municipal votes uh, were on all cannabis establishments and it didn't state that it needed to be on the ballot in November of 2024. Um, I know in my town, I'm sure that they'd put it on the ballot regardless of how the individuals who would be doing that feel because they know that the people of Derry want legalization. But if it doesn't stay which, which election it needs to be in, if you have the people who are in charge of setting up that ballot who are against it, they may not actually put it on the ballot that first year, and it may be delayed. And so for consistency's sake, it should be on the ballot everywhere November of 2024 and allow for a petition in the future if it fails. Um, residency, it adds that the establishments must register with the Secretary of State with the principal place of business in New Hampshire, just to keep New Hampshire cannabis, New Hampshire. Information materials and medical lock boxes. We're adding the standard symbol for products from the Hunt Amendment and also adding the requirement for medical lock boxes. To be honest, when I first read that, it scared me because I thought we were talking about something really complex like I've seen with medication coming out of a really expensive, crazy machine or a safe. I googled medical lock box and it looks like the little cash boxes you see at Staples that you have at yard sales or at Girl Scout cookie drives. If that is what we intend as a medical lock box, something that keeps out a curious kid, then I see no problem with stocking that in the stores and you know, what a great way for somebody to carry their products home, right? <laughs> Um, and then we also have the lawful operation. Um, it just flows through, adds the new entities, and it adds a equal starting gun for outlets once there's supply to open. There's definitely been concern about the idea of not opening any outlets until the Liquor, can liquor Commission certifies that there's sufficient supply to operate. But that's the reason that that's in there is to because one, we know that they're not going to be doing anything to handicap this market opening when it's ready to go. You know, they're, they're not going to sit on it and they're not just going to wait and delay on it. I have far more faith in them than to think that they would do that. But number two, that means that the ATCs um, that in this bill do get one of three of the 15 licenses, assuming that they meet all of the qualifications and filing deadlines, that um, they are not starting any earlier than anybody else. So that's one of those areas where we're bringing it back to make sure that it's fully fair. And then proof of ID, it adds the requirements on licenses you had, adds your enforcement activity verifying noncompliance. 
Um, we did change, do a change in the OPLC language to misconduct instead of malpractice. I talked to, um, to I talked to Director Lindsay about that, and uh, or Director Courtney about that, and um, and she preferred the word misconduct instead of malpractice. Um, data collection. I've I've just found out we probably could do a better job of uh, of specifying what's necessary and who is responsible for that. So um, if if you'd like, I can try and come back later with a little bit more on that. But that'll just be a nuance as we move forward. And then it moves to an agency fee instead of the rooms, meal, and cannabis. So we're looking. We put in ten percent. I know that the commission was talking about fifteen percent. But this also is the policy committee, not the finance commit, the financial committee. So if we move over with an agency fee to Ways and Means, then they can figure out if 10 or 15 is the right number over there. Um, so I think I think that I would just take the fact that we've moved to an agency fee, which is structured very similar to that franchise fee, and hopefully hopefully you can take that as a win, even if the actual number filled in is different, since that is more the domain of Ways and Means than commerce. Uh, finally, in the Controlled Drug Act definitions, um, we link it to the marijuana definition in the new uh, legalization of cannabis, and we remove the deadline to act for conversion from nonprofit. So I know that was a lot to go through, um, and I apologize that it came to you just today, but this was the fastest we could do it. This was a pretty substantial rewrite in six days, and I'm happy that we were able to get this to you in the form that it's in. And um, I would be, I guess the other, one other thing, I gave you another piece of paper that has the current DUI laws. Um, as far as cannabis DUIs, people are already getting arrested and already serving the consequences of a cannabis DUI. You do not need to test to a certain limit in order to have a DUI, and the consequences are significant, including never being able to go to J Japan, having to apply to get into Canada, and not being able to go to Mexico for 10 years if you have a DUI. So it's even more than just what the state puts on top of us. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, first of all, for the Department of Safety in their section, mm -hmm. so you'll work with them to get that paragraph yes. straightened out? Yes. I'd love to get language from them that would work so that we can do that. They probably want to, may, want to, may want to address a couple of those challenges as well. So do you want to... Do you are willing to write something for her to correct it, or are you expecting her to give you something? Uh, I wasn't expecting to write anything, but I can provide some of the challenges, what we expect in the wording uh, based on her consultation. Okay. Now, you're the Department of Safety. Is that where you're under? Yes. Okay. I'm with the State Police. Right. Well, yeah, the other guy looked like a trooper, but, you know. He's yeah. more <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to assume that that paragraph will have get an amendment for. Well, we're obviously meet again next week, mm -hmm. so we need to have that straightened out for next week. Okay. okay. All right. Any other <laughs> comments or questions people might have? Yes, Representative Michael. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hunt, um, and thank you for taking my question. One thing I'm a little confused about is. Uh, you, in in one line, I see uh, if the commissioner approves your license, and then another place I see the commission. Uh, who was actually going to approve somebody's license, and, and what what sort of criteria is, is there? Any uh, like financial bonding or something that somebody needs? And I, I guess I'm a little concerned that there might be uh, uh, a little bit of favoritism one way or another if if a single person is making. Uh, approving somebody's license and disapproving somebody else's. If you could explain that process. Um, thank you. That's actually a great point. That's one of the areas that was going to largely be left with to rulemaking. But anything that you would want to set in as guardrails, I think, especially if there's some inconsistency in the language, uh, if you can follow up with me to just help me find those. I'm, I'm going a little bit cross-eyed from reading through this probably 100 times over the last six days, if not more. Um, and I apologize for missing that. But I would love to standardize that language to make sure that it works. I do know that in some of the things in the Department of Health and Human Services, it's um, the commissioner or a designee. Um, but we'd need to figure out what would be the appropriate 
section there and the appropriate person to approve it. But I do recognize we have an amazing commissioner right now. But um, just like I say with other departments, just because the person here is amazing, and it doesn't mean that the next election will be as great. So let's make sure we legislate for to future proof it and not just rely on how amazing our current people are. Thank you. Represent Bullio. Thank you for taking my question. The um, the amount of stores that would be licensed initially, 15, is there a provision where, you know, within a, a, a year or two, there could be 20 or 25, or is there a limit of 15, and that's it? Uh, thank you. So in the um, so in the the Hunt Amendment that had come out, it had said fifteen for five years and then reassessing every five right. years. In this one, it says fifteen for for thirty months to consider to see how many are necessary and to review it every year. Um, and that's the commission reviewing that just so that they can be more adaptive to the market because you don't want to tie their hands so that if suddenly we notice because there's areas of the state that don't actually have supply through these retail outlets and if we find that there's more of an illicit market in those regions, it may actually make sense to increase that because that would be a public safety issue. Um, but it also doesn't require them to increase that number either. Thank you. I'm trying, I'm trying to split the baby. Cut that baby in half. Okay. Anybody else? I seem to be losing people here. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, this, uh, Mr. Chairman, do you want to have any first impressions or you have want to say anything, what you've seen or heard so far? Okay. Anybody else would like to uh, comment on what we've heard or seen so far? Okay. <laughs> Don't make me mad at you again. <laughs> I'll try to be less than that. I wish. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to make one point. Um, and that is, um, you know, I view this as I'm really uh, entirely in accord with uh, Chairman Hunt on this. Uh, you know, I see that we have basically, um, you know, three um, uh, solutions, uh, bills, formats, whatever. One is the franchise model um, that was, uh, you know, basically um, promulgated and um, and uh, suggested by the commission and uh, and uh, leadership and so on, um, which um, is uh, the franchise model. We have the uh, we have 1633 that was originally submitted, um, you know, to this committee, um, and then we have um, Representative uh, Land's amendment. Um, basically, I think it's really quite simple. Um, we have uh, two bills that are essentially non-starters and one bill which is a starter, um, you know, and by that I mean it is a it is a decent foundational beginning, um, and it's something that I think that can pass. And when I say that, um, I mean that the franchise bill is a non-starter because it's legally non-viable as it's written. Now, I pointed out some of that the, the last time I had an opportunity to we speak. We don't need to go there. And I'm not going to go there again. Thank I'm just you. saying. I'm just referencing that. And the um, the um, franchise model. Um, and the um, and 1633 is politically unviable, and so it's a non-starter. So really, my point is that I think that by simply changing the language from franchisee to either cannabis outlet store or licensed agent or something like that, that we avoid all of the liabilities and issues and risks that I had pointed out the last time. Um, and I think that that would be a, a path forward to, to laying a foundation for legalization. How's that? Three minutes, right? Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Questions? No? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We're not having a hearing. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I'll be, I'll be brief. My name is uh, Daryl Eames. I'm the, the founder of the New Hampshire Cannabis Association. Um, we did submit one very short thing today. It's about a three-minute read. If you want to understand what we're talking about, not in terms of state stores or franchises, it's really concepts of, of risk and plant touching 
cannabis entities versus cannabis related businesses versus other. And this will go through that very quickly. So you can get a kind of get a concept of where this model fits within the risk profiles of about the four different licensing schemes that we've been talking about. And then at the bottom is just a very short bullet point list on how this threads the needle to meet the governor's criteria. And so I think the melding of these two concepts uh, was was a lot of hard work, but I think it has been accomplished here. So just recommend, if you don't mind, two to three minute read, give that a look. And if you have any questions, by all means, reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Seeds, <laughs> come on up. Seeds. Seeds are us. Advisory Board of uh, New Hampshire Cannabis Association. And Daryl Eames just mentioned a comparison that we put together. And I, I would just like to take a moment to compare how this amended 1633 uh, meets the criteria that was the charge for the commission, because it had very specific requirements. And it, the commission uh, shall study the feasibility of establishing a state-controlled system to sell marijuana to adults 21 years or older that allows the state to control the distribution and access. Well, this bill, as amended, does put the state in control of licensing, regulation, distribution, and access. So it meets that criteria. Keeps marijuana away from kids and out of schools. And the bill contains numerous provisions to prevent persons under 21 from purchasing cannabis and uh, pre prohibits cannabis establishments from being located near schools. So it meets that. Controls the marketing and messaging. This bill has numerous restrictions and even some prohibitions on the marketing and advertising of cannabis and cannabis products. Prohibits marijuana miles or oversaturation. This bill puts a limit, as we've heard, of 15 on the number statewide of retail stores and uh, giving the Liquor Commission and municipalities the power to approve uh, all licenses. As another criteria empowers municipalities to choose to limit or prohibit establishments, and this bill requires municipalities to vote in the affirmative in order to have retail establishments. And reduces the incidences of multi-drug use. It establishes funds and mechanisms for drug abuse education prevention and treatment and now here's the one that i only give it a half check mark does not impose an additional tax so so as to remain competitive this bill is called an agency fee of 10 percent uh, but it would impose a new tax but the other bill uh, that the commission was working on ha also had a 15 percent tax so those two uh, are different but they, uh, you know, with this one being more competitive, uh, but they both do impose a tax and raise uh, considerable funds. And finally, I'd just like to make uh, one new point, and that is uh, I just became aware of a new uh, research report put out by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, looking at uh, youth, cannabis youth, use after legalization in Washington State. And uh, they studied the uh, eighth graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders rate of cannabis use prior to legalization and then what happened after legalization. And here's just a paragraph I'd like to read from that study. The observed overall decreases in cannabis use among students in grades 8, 10, and 12 might be associated with changes in the availability of cannabis among persons aged over 21, as well as the limited opportunities to engage in use. The period 2012 through 2014 includes the legalization of non-medical cannabis in Washington State in 2012. Researchers studied the association of cannabis laws with cannabis use among high school students and have observed similar declines in cannabis use after legalization of non-medical cannabis. The legalization of non-medical cannabis for adults aged over 21 in Washington with, with licensed dispensaries requiring proof of age 
might have affected availability of cannabis to younger persons as well as their opportunities to engage in use. And I attended most of the Cannabis Commission hearings, and we heard a lot of concern, and rightly so, of whether legalization would increase the use uh, among young people. And actually, the Center for Disease Control Research is finding that just the opposite is happening in other states. So it's certainly not a foregone conclusion. And I've sent the link to that report to the chair and uh, encourage you to take a look at that uh, because I think it's pretty revealing. Uh, very interesting. So thank for you for your time and thanks for all your hard work on this. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Yes, sir. Come on up. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Nix. Uh, I am the Supervisory Intelligence Analyst at the New Hampshire Information Analysis Center. Our center is mentioned uh, in the original drafting of this bill, and it's also mentioned in the most revised copy. So I wanted to take a moment and just speak to the statutory obligations that have been outlined in the bill and how that is uh, more or less doomed uh, from the start, just in terms of <laughs> what we are legally uh, allowed to collect or what we, by base of policy and procedure, have access to to collect. Um, I've worked for the Department of Safety for 11 years. Um, my politics aren't relevant, nor is my really position on this bill. I'm speaking specifically to what are outlined as mandates or uh, statutory expectations of what our center can or cannot do. I would politely bring you to page 30, line 28 is what I'll be speaking to. And in my seven years of working uh, at the information, six years of working at the Information Analysis Center, I spent all of that time in some way, shape, or form responsible for the oversight of or the publication of the drug monitoring initiative. The data sets that go into that, its history, and its perspective outlook. Um, that's a longer conversation, but even just in the first few lines here. Uh, no later than six months after the effective date of this chapter and every two years thereafter, we shall produce a report uh, that speaks to all a bunch of subsequent uh, health and welfare outcomes. I just would like to bring you back and show you a brief history of kind of the drug environment report and the drug monitoring initiative, if that's okay, Sarge. Um, that started as a request in the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police Association in the fall of 2013, directly in response to increased law enforcement reports or reportings to fatal and non-fatal heroin overdoses at the time. Uh, that took approximately, I believe, 11 months uh, to get up and running and simply identify the partners and the memorandums of understanding and the uh, memos of agreement between agencies simply within the Department of Safety for data collection. Then it took us an additional, I believe, nine to 11 months to get that public out for public consumption. So simply within the department, that took approximately two years to identify and aggregate and put together all the data and collect and identify those sources to produce that product, mostly within the department itself, not including the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, the Department of Health and Human Services, Bureau of Drug and Alcohol Services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so from the first line here, within six months of passing this bill or enacting this chapter, um, we would simply, I would not be able to meet that obligation to you. And then subsequently, there are policy and procedure as well as statutory um, um, barriers to fulfilling some of these requirements that I am uh, certainly not the most educated to speak on. Uh, but I felt it was worth coming here being the one who um, QAQCs and oversees that product, as well as the one who's put it together for the last several years to just speak about some of the statutory expectations that um, are put on our center and how we will not be able to meet those. Um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation and answering any questions that you have. So, um, so really it should be two years to get your first baseline, right? Uh, at least. Right. So I mean, after two years, you'll have a, you can then be looking back where, when, when the bill goes into effect. Uh, if, if I could yep. interject for one second. <laughs> yeah of the information that currently appears in that drug monitoring initiative is actually owned by somebody else. It is not owned by the IAC. It's okay. owned by the chief medical examiner's officers, uh, DHS, uh, drug and alcohol uh, service, and uh, division of EMS. 
So right. they have a actual uh, way to collect that information. They're the ones doing the surveys. They're the ones receiving this information. They're able to provide us with that data set that we can then produce a product to show. So Okay, so would it be better if we just take all this out here and say every two years after effect that you can give us a summary and anything you think that would be re relative for us to understand the marijuana consumption in the state? Only if there is a viable data set of information that we could analyze. That's a lot of potentials and hypotheticals that I'm probably not positioned to speak <laughs> right. to or answer today. Right. Well, I'm just wondering how would you re rewrite this? Because obviously the, they wrote this all hoping, you know, fantasizing that they could get all this data. Sure. But as we all know, the, those data points were probably impossible. Obviously, you know. High school, you know, rate, uh, adult, uh, adult rates of alcohol. I mean, I mean, how would anybody know any of these numbers? But you know, the surveys that are taken out there. But yes, Representative Calabro, having been the QA medical lead at Harbor Care Health and Wellness Clinic, um, that information can be collected at various clinics, deciding which ones you want to basically do those treatments. Um, I think that's information that is entirely possible as QA medical lead. I think you can do all of these things. It's time consuming, and I know it's cumbersome. Believe me, I, I've had enough statistics. But okay. I, I think we want to keep this simple. Because <laughs> the last thing we want to do is have this paragraph bog us down going right. forward with this legislation. Not so, in six months, but maybe in, in two years. But I think it's viable. Okay. So what we want is, you, is for you guys to figure out how we would write this paragraph to state what the general concept is to do this um and you can put in all the qualifiers you can based upon what data you've been allowed to have access to mm -hmm. you know just whatever qualifiers you want to put in here to to you know meet the needs that you what you believe you're capable of doing is that possible <laughs> I haven't really de de dealt with the Department of Safety too much. I used to know. I don't believe this typically falls <laughs> under sweet. my other duties as assigned to write state legislation. Yeah, I was saying. Uh, I mean, maybe I can, maybe I can have your former trooper, <laughs> the, the chief of enforcement, to <laughs> to write it because he's now getting getting used to my asking these requests. But I guess we, uh, given that I have no idea that you people even existed. Okay. <laughs> and well, apparently uh, somebody did when they wrote the bill. Yeah, somebody so thought, our, somebody... our argument is that we would not be in a position to write anything currently um, because we are unaware of any programs that exist that would collect all of the information. Yeah, that well, we, we, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind there's no way you could collect all this data. Disqualification of any juvenile records that they want from the court, right. which is prohibited by RSA 17. There you go. Okay, so you, but you could go through this and know what you can and can't do, right? On one, on a few small seconds, yes. But there's other sections of this that it's not our. Then I don't, I don't put it in. It's what I'm saying. I, I want you to to um, uh, pretend like you're AI and you're just going to go through in there and and delete out everything you can't do, and whatever's left of what you know you can do. Is that possible? I know this is a task you're not used to taking on. I'm not in a position to be writing legislation for uh, this committee or this group, uh, but we would be willing to work with them if they come up with their own, another set of- yeah, But how would she know what you can't, so how about you go through there and cross out everything you can't do? How about that? Can you cross out what you don't think you can do? I mean, I'm trying to. How do I make this dialogue? You, you're going to ask her to rewrite something, and she's writing it in a vacuum because she doesn't know anything what you can and can't do. Okay, only you guys know that. So how do we, how do we solve this chicken and the egg? How do we? To me, the easiest thing for you to do is go in there and cross out anything that you, you have no way of doing. Maybe there's nothing Which left. Would be a lot of that document. What's that? Which would be a lot of that document. We're we're not the ones who go out and send out these surveys, right? We're not reaching out to people. It's, for this information. And that would be the qualifier. 
Right. Saying would, that that there would be a need to be a mechanism that all this that, information is being that sent. the that these assuming you, you would start out by saying assuming what you're capable of acquiring that data that you're capable uh, that that are, are that you have been able to receive. I don't know what's the what's the right qualifier. How you would like to write that? I would argue that per I don't know how our name of our. Uh, a center came to be. Oh, you just want to be out of this bill altogether. I would argue. Now I get it. I would argue we're we're not the best position to report on health and welfare outcomes. That okay. is not our responsibility or our job. Okay, perfect. Got it. You want out? I got it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, Kate. Where did this Where did this come from? Did you come from you guys? Where did it come from? Yeah. Who is anybody in the room going to claim this paragraph? I, I know, but 1639 is, well, let me put it this way. I didn't write it. <laughs> no, is nobody in the room going to claim ownership of this paragraph? Right, because evidently no one told them that they were in this bill. Uh, uh, well, obviously somebody they, they, they were here they got wind of it yeah you know what i'm saying they never got wind of it until till yesterday so um <laughs> all right so i mean in case, would you be offended if we take this out of the bill so this is 318 f24 page 30 page 30 Question. I'm I'm assuming you would be the, be the person who would be coach uh, you know cheering for this. But in the meantime, while you look at it, yes, Representative Calabro, you have a question. Wouldn't this be the purview of DHHS? I mean, this is the data that we collect. That it, the... uh, somebody came. Yeah. The, this it, is. Oh, this well, is I do have a hand data. for HHS. Yeah. <laughs> Former legal counsel. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. That's right. You were in the room when that happened. Okay, get in, speak to the mic, tell everybody who you are. You can turn the mic on. Yeah. Paul, thank you. Do I have to hold it? No. Okay. My name is Paul Toomey. I'm former House Legal Counsel. I'm a member of the Cannabis Coalition. I've been working with Marijuana Policy Project and ACLU for years on these bills in probably drafted a lot of um, the bill that this originally came from, but not this section. But I agree with what the representative just said, that this is really a function of health and human services. And you could either just put it in there and ask them to do a report or take it completely out and address it with a separate, I mean, you've got two years to get some kind of a report uh, out of after it. After reading the last sentence, I think this is the reason why it was given to them. Okay, Liz. He, he threw you guys under the bus to be, when he began his testimony. He said the chief of police asked for heroin information, and that's how he started collecting this data. Do you know anything about this paragraph? Okay. Oh, you're going to deny that. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, Kate. What's that? Yes, we should. We can delete it. I feel it's mixed. I feel you have two different entities that you're asking to provide information, each of them equally able to do so, but they're two different entities. I, what I find is striking is how did, how did anybody expect it to get paid for? So I'm not from the department, the individual yes. who is. No, she used that. to be. <laughs> used to used be, to be with Health and Human Services. I, I do want to clarify. So this information has been in here from the very beginning. Right. Obviously, we want some indicators because we want to know whether or not there's an impact on many of these things. So I do import. I do uh, think in, um, the inclusion of some of this is important. A lot of this data, though, is already available either from the Department of Health and Human Services or the Department of Safety. So I think it's just a matter. They, of Department of Safety just made clear they don't want well, to be in this bill. They want out. 
and that they get their that whatever data they get is people are nice enough to give it to them. But what motor vehicle? They don't have data on motor for vehicle. That's who they accidents. were. Department of Safety. Okay, um, but I do believe that some kind of data collection is really important. I would defer to the Department of Health and Human Services. I think they have a lot of this data. I can't speak to like if there would be a okay. fiscal note. I don't. I wouldn't take the whole section out. But well, I'm going to take the whole section out because I don't know who's going to do it. Do you have a friend you can call at HHS to find out? Yeah, he's here. He just stepped out. Oh, oh. Go get, go I'll, ask, get him. I'll ask him. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have something else they want to point out that's been in this bill all along? And <laughs> Representative Gibbs. Uh, yeah, you just made the point that I was going to make, actually, which is that while this data would be useful to have, uh, I don't think it's crucial to the bill, and maybe just delete that whole paragraph. Great. There he is. Oh, yes, there's HHS. <laughs> but so did did you know? Do you guys do this now for the ATCs? Uh, for the record, my name is Michael Holt. I'm the administrator of the Therapeutic Cannabis Program with the Department of Health and Human Services. I'm happy to take your questions. Do you seen this paragraph before? Uh, yes, I've seen the paragraph. Um, uh, I believe this paragraph has been in the bill in right. various inc incarnations, you know, for a number of years or versions. Um, we uh, recently explored this a little bit more because there was there's a couple data points that HHS um, uh, feels would be are important, um, okay. especially with with, with regard to um, uh, uh, childhood poisonings um, and accidental ingestions. So we added there, um, added that in here. We also added in a provision um, to. Now, when you say added that in, so you you were actually help contribute. Oh uh, yes, I, I we were working. I was working with uh, Representative Leon on some of the language that impacts HHS. Okay. Um, so the structure here has been in legislation for some versions probably years long i Got do it. not know who or wrote that the drug monitoring initiative would publish all this data so i don't know the right. origins of that okay. but based on what has been in this bill all this time we were looking at the data the data sets and we believe that it's important to know uh if accidental childhood ingestions increase after legalization it's a critical piece that you know prevention um uh specialists you know uh, want to know about cannabis legalization. So that's the that was the genesis of my recent involvement in this section. Um, so we also added the, the provision that um, Department of Safety would collaborate with the people who hold the data. Um, the, the entities holding the data include OCME, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, HHS, and there's a reference to graduation rates, so that's, you know, Department of Education. Um, obviously, any data sharing is going to require an MOU between agencies. Um, we do these uh, on a regular basis. The collaboration requirement um, here in the statute would give us the authority to collaborate and enter into MOUs or, and data sharing agreements with other agencies. Um, I do not know who is the holder of all of these data sets. Um, I can go back to HHS and determine which data sets we currently hold. Um, and report back to this committee, if you like. Um, I, I do not, I'm, I'm not an expert in all of these data sets, but it is important um, for any cannabis legalization effort to establish baseline data before the program starts so that we know the impacts of cannabis legalization moving forward after legalization. You heard about a reference from the CDC um, by a previous uh, speaker um, about uh, before and after with regard to Washington state. So uh, from a public health standpoint, you know, baseline data and you know, what happens after legalization is just critical information for the state to have to know what the impact is. So I would, I would urge this paragraph be left in um, and allow us to come back with some, uh, some other information um, with regard to, uh, or more clarity on who holds these data sets. Um, and uh, if we can, if there's another entity, we can add in that, en that other entity. If these data sets don't exist, we'll, you know, we can take them out. But let's, let us take a first stab at, you know, who holds the data? And us being Health and Human Services. Health and Human Services. Okay. So I'm going to look Th forward to for you guys to rewrite this paragraph based upon your, the department's capabilities of getting this done. 
we will work in collaboration with the Department, drug of, the Department of Safety because the, the, the requirement here is that the Department of Safety's drug monitoring uh, initiative publishes the data. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not an expert here. I, I'll yeah. I'll, we will collaborate with uh, the, the DMI um, on, on publishing location. Um, I don't know if that's the best place or maybe it is the best place. So happy to get back to you with some more information. Okay. But I can't commit to you know, giving you the, the be all end all policy. Okay. Here, here's this, uh, what I'm really looking for. I'm just looking for a department to do this. Okay. And I just got one department that says, please do not make us do this. So, so I'm asking, I'm looking to health and human services now to take a look at this paragraph. And this is why we don't come to the meetings, right? You know, because we got to sign things. <laughs> In hindsight, right? So, um, Otherwise, we would have just taken it out. Otherwise, we would just rip it out. In other words, if, I, if we can't have somebody who is willing to take it on, knows what you can and can't do, okay? And the language could simply say is um, have a plan on how you're going to go about doing this. Like MO, uh, you know, getting your you know, letters of understanding, doing, writing out that dialogue about how you're going to best do it and uh, uh, how the frequency you feel comfortable doing and it. the cost it's going to take and all and all that. i assume there must be a physical yeah. so note attached I'm, to this i'm happy to 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 regroup with um our team collaborate okay. with the uh, department of safety staff um and uh determine uh and give a recommendation on how best to uh proceed with this element and rewrite this paragraph for next week Okay. Otherwise, I, will, I, will, I commit to doing. Otherwise, my best. it'll be gone, and then you'll have to wait till it gets on the Senate side, or, or ways and means, and maybe. We will. We will have some, point. even if it's where available language. Um, uh, you could put all the qualifiers you want in here for me. Excellent. Okay. I'll take. I'll take all the qualifiers. I just so you can at least have a placeholder. How's that? Sounds good. Representative Gibbs. I was just going to suggest that since so many other states have already legalized marijuana, insofar as data exists on these types of questions, I would assume that they have data. Why do we need to represent, why do we need to reinvent the wheel by collecting our own data? New Hampshire isn't that different from Massachusetts or Maine or Vermont. Uh, I mean, sure, there are differences, but we're all human beings. Why not just look for data from other states? I would just offer that many states don't establish baseline data before they legalize. Um, and the, the hallmark of this uh, proposal is that New Hampshire should establish baseline data to see, see change over time. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs> Representative Lynn, do you have an opinion on, on this paragraph? Sorry. Yes, that uh, paragraph was in the amendment because there was some more clarity about who would be working with everybody. So I will work with them in order to come with an amendment. Um, there was one other, if, if, if we're good with this one, there is one other section as well where it okay. had been raised in the hallway with me. Um, it was around the annulment language and just okay. the idea that the way that it's written, there could be some uh, confusion about how to implement it. And to just add the words that um, not no more than the possession limit, but no more than the current possession limit, so that there's not a question about whether it was at the time of the conviction or currently. So I'll bring that language as an amendment as well. We can talk about it at that yeah. point, but I didn't want to blindside you with another section being changed. Okay. So what, what works fine is it would have the amendment drawn up. Yes. Okay. And then when uh, the committee takes up the sub, when we take up the subcommittee next week, we can just vote multiple amendments. Okay. And then bundle them together and send them off to legislative services. So by the time mm -hmm. the committee votes on it, it will have the final. Okay. So to do that and stack within this amendment, so starting with this one and then have the amendment on. If you can put all the of the ones section, that you know of, yeah, then yeah. Into put, one to, into to one. do that. That section F24 yeah. and then the annulment to add the current possession. Right. Exactly. Okay. To just and if let all get, what I'm just saying is magic. it's okay if they were separate, if they had to be. Okay, because okay, legislative yes. services can handle that. Yes. In other words, we can vote multiple amendments to a bill, but mm -hmm. that if you can throw it all into one and get it all done, that's even better. Okay, and if um, 
I, I assume that any language we get on the data collection is probably going to be better than what we have. Exactly. Um, so because well, we, 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 you know, I don't know how long you've been in the room, but yeah, we're, I've, yeah, we're, you heard, you heard where we left it. Yes. No, I just moved over so that I could have some of that back conversation. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get the new language on F24 and then just add that word current into the annulment, which would add to that amendment. Right. Um, and just move forward from there for you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Is there anything else? Speak now or forevermore hold your peace. Are we going to be going into stuff now, or going into stuff now, or well, next week? The handle. Oh. No, he, is there no I we we can't. We don't have all the amendments that all we right. need so to we do can, to I fix can it. Raise all concerns and stuff next week, or next time we talk. What concerns do you want to talk about? Well, I don't have a lot of time because I have to be somewhere. I have to be in Berlin at five. Okay. Um, I don't know how long is it to Berlin? That's way up there. That's two hours. Two hours. So okay. I leave soon. So um, that means you so, got to leave right now. Right. So I don't know if we want to get into it now or. Well, why don't you why don't you run down the list I, I, and then I, I'll what decide I, what what's the problem. Is, is there's one 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 thing that I really want changed is I don't like the fifteen the fifteen. I can deal with that. What I don't like is the idea that there's just this re meeting uh, or the commission will meet every five years or whatever to no uh, that's gone she says it's now every year said she had well, i might have missed that when i went to the restaurant but well that's okay, okay. well then filled in what was said <laughs> so, uh it's she you're you want to repeat it so why don't you stay here so you okay let me hear what you th what you said and i'll tell you what i was thinking uh, and not then a I'll problem. Be late to my so uh, the way that it it now is in this amendment is that it's 15 stores, and after 30 30 months after enactment, they would assess whether or not there needs to be more, and then to reassess it every year annually. But, annually, but there's no there's no there's no tripping mechanisms to say that based on this condition it would increase. It leaves it entirely yes. to the so, commission. So that that is not exactly what I think we need because I've raised this with you, John. I don't like the idea of creating medallions. This is going to create the medallion system or the Montana liquor. Right, system. I got it. So what I like to avoid that is to have some fixed number that every thirty months or three years or whatever they are become available. So maybe there's three licenses that become available. So how did you like my language about market area, the market area analysis and the commission would then <clears throat> do? Yeah, I, I would rather have it just be fixed because the market will decide. Well, or, or, fixes, or, fixes veto bait. Is what? Veto. Governor would veto if if you put But see, the, fixed the, numbers the reality in. of it is, and I think that this concern, I know there's a, I don't like most of this, but I'm like willing to compromise on much of it. But and I and I talked to her, and I think a lot of good is in here. You know, I raised the annulment thing that I thought was confusing because that's like the key part for me. But this is the other key part for me. Okay, creating a medallion system is bad. This is going to do that. It, we know it's going to do it. We know that the people who get these licenses are going to tr do their damnedest to build a moat around their businesses. We've seen it in industry and after industry. There's a huge ton of literature of economic history that shows plenty of examples of this happening and we're setting it up now. Okay. So, but when I had my it. paragraph, what I thought I was brilliant <laughs> was that you mean the one that you gave us last week and then we told a new one was coming. I didn't read it. So I okay. can go back and look so at it. So anyway, so it's the yellow section and, and if you like a copy of it, you can have it here and in it, it says that the commission would do a market analysis and so therefore would expand make a recommendation for expansion based on that market analysis. So it could come back and say we need another 30 stores. I'll, I'll look at it. I mean, it seems to me like the, the, doing the market analysis opens a door up for them to be influenced by. Okay, well, now you get back to the what the governor wants was the, that the no uh, lobbying. What? No lobbying. You know, you, that, that nobody who's, who's been given a store is allowed to lobby the legislature. That, that's which not, I, that's which not, is not in saying. here. You didn't put it in here at all. I'm that's, just telling you that's the reason why the governor did that. Okay, well, I, I, so, so you're asking, you're basically saying. So then, the then if he's right. worried, if he's worried, you're saying the governor's right. If he's worried about their them lobbying, lobbying against to opening a any more industry, then then he then he should be okay and not want to veto my suggestion. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, All right. He was worrying about them being the lobbyists to uh, making sure that that the only I think that they should have a right theirs. to lobby in in the way. I do, I did they too. I agree. They shouldn't have a right to okay. create build walls around their their businesses. Okay. Um, all right. Anyways, we can bring what, it up next time because I have to be somewhere. All right. What other complaint? What other concerns you have? Or is that that that, that, that is it? Like the that other ones it. have been largely addressed. Uh, but that one that one's like a, a key sticking point. That one and the annulment thing were the two. Okay. And uh, I mean, I, well, it sounds like the, 15, yeah, the annulment we're going to take care of. And um, I, I, in terms of expansion and putting in hard numbers in the, into the legislation, uh, I, it's extremely problematic. I mean, it, you're you're being variable about your numbers, about what numbers you want. What does that even mean? I'm being oh, variable. Richard, what do you mean? You're I just saying you're saying okay, I want uh, five stores every five years. Are you 10 stores or you want 30 stores or how many stores do you want and what time period were you thinking? I just want there to be a mechanism where if the market wants more stores, they can get it. And your language does not state that. Your okay. language could vary in 30 years okay. from now. Okay, here's your, here's your project. Have you come up with your solution? That I just you think told is you right. solution. What's that? I What's just... your solution? You just said mechanism. So mechanism Building implies for every, every every three years. Every three years. The, a certain number number. We can decide the number. What number? Tell us the number now. Let's say three. Three three licenses become available every every three years. Fine. If there's no market available for them, then then they, they won't be taken. But if there are, then okay. we know that, that... What if there's more? Okay. What if the market wants more? So, Representative, are you okay with every I three years, another three stores? Um, I think we'd want to look at what the analysis of what the actual market capacity is. If it's actually a market clearing um, scenario of 55 stores, that would take a long time to get from that 15 to 55. Yeah, we, but we I do. do like the idea of opening up a certain number of licenses because this is going to be a market as it evolves. I don't. If we have a number where they're not all taken, I think that's actually a good position to be in. Right. Um, so I'd be happy to discuss what a number would make would make sense. So that, for that. That's okay. fine. So you'll, I, I, I would figure out the number. Sure. And, yeah, she's going to be doing the amendment. Okay. You can work that. Sounds out with good. Her. Okay. All right. And uh, additionally, I had one other thing about the lobbying. Um, we yeah. had the discussion earlier today with chairs and vice chairs about the idea of state employees. Um, so if state employees are able to come and speak and lobby to us. Um, it's actually exempt from lobbying. Yes. So the idea of having a carve out for franchisees would be a problem. Um, anybody who has is employed based upon it with their testimony you would need to register as a lobbyist. But if you're just having if you're a volunteer, then you don't. So we already have clear language around lobbying and trying to change it around one industry would be highly problematic. We have other areas that are very much a medallion system in the state, and I think that doing special treatment here instead of others is problematic. Fair enough. All right, so but you will work with him yes. on his expansion mm -hmm. language. Okay, now, is there anything more? All right. 